before I do that. All right. Festerson, Here. Gray, Here. Harding, Here. Melton, Here. Pauls, Here. Palermo. Here. Mr. President. Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation by Council Member Harding. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, just a couple quick comments. I'll start out by... Uh, noting that it's uh, Alan Thielen's um, last city council meeting, I believe, and we want to—he's on to uh, greener pastures, even though he doesn't look that old. <laughs> uh, but we wish him well in his next endeavor, and thank him for his service to the city of Omaha. And then, <laughs> and then also, uh, we're about to be. Um, invaded by tigers and razorbacks and cardinals and all sorts of animals and they're not going to be new residents at the zoo it's uh the kickoff this week of uh one of our crown jewels the um uh, college world series so let's all hope for good weather uh during the day maybe a little rain at night to keep things green and wish all the teams and their fans a good stay in omaha thank you An affidavit of publication is on file for the pre-council and city council meeting, and a current copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in a white binder on the East Wall of Legislative Chambers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this meeting of the Omaha City Council. The council thanks you for joining us here today. As a courtesy to those in attendance, please silence or turn off your phones and other devices at this time. Madam Clerk. Item 6 to 8 can be considered together for Xarbon Village Replat 18, located at 2210 South 64th Avenue. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item 6, an ordinance to approve a major amendment to a mixed-use district development agreement to allow for the development of townhomes on the site. Item 7, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Xarbon Village Replat 18. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend denial of a waiver of Section 5399 sidewalks. Item 8, a resolution to approve the final plat for Xarbon Village Replat 18. The public hearing on item 16, or excuse me, 6 through 8 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Uh, Mr. President, members of the City Council, Todd Swerzek, 2285 South 67th Street with Noddle Companies. I am here to answer any questions you might have about the plat or the major amendment. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item six through eight are approved seven to zero. Yes. Items nine and ten can be considered together for property located northeast of Saddle Creek Road and Wakeley Street. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. These communication and support. Item 9, an ordinance to rezone this property from R3, medium density, and GC district to GC district. Item 10, an ordinance to amend the boundaries of the MCC overlay district to incorporate this property into that district. The public hearings on items 9 and 10 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Melton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. 9 and 10 are approved, 7 to 0. Item 11, an application to consider a Class CK liquor license for a catered affair located at 3016 North 102nd Street. The public hearing on item 11 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Kathy Sylvie with A Catered Affair, 3016 North 102nd Street. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. 
Are there any other proponents? Any <coughs> opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 11 is approved, <coughs> 7 to 0. Item 12, an application to consider a Class C liquor license for a throwback barcade lounge located at 1402 Howard Street, A's communication opposition, B's communication from the planning department. Public hearing on item 12 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Uh, Mr. President, members of the council, uh, Mike Kelly, 2804 South 87th Avenue. Appearing here with the applicant, uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. Brianna. Uh, fam car. Um, this is an application for a lounge at 1402 uh, Howard Street. Um, I think there's been a little bit of confusion here. Um, this is trying to be a high-end uh, part of a redevelopment, about a two and a half million dollar redevelopment of that corner. Um, it does include a rooftop uh, and we'll discuss that here for questions on that. Um, I think I'd like to have Brianna go ahead and tell the council what what's your vision here for this business of course name and address please name and address brianna fom car address is 2205 north 188th street elkhorn nebraska 68022 um the concept and the idea behind throwback barcade and lounge is a high-end establishment that is meant to be marketed to demographics ages 35 to 45 uh, with interest in the 80s, specifically music, um, people that have nostalgia for the 80s. Um, the idea is to have a place where people can go as a date night, right? Um, the rooftop is going to have oversized gaming. Um, it is there for people to socialize, communicate with their friends, hang out with friends, and have a good time and be able to conversate. Um, downstairs, um, it is going to be more of a lounge type feel, um, again, demographics ages 30 to 45 looking to have a good time and hang out with their friends. Um, might I, Mike Kelly again, may I also say this is a raise and rebuild. This, the, the, so the building here, and there may be some confusion about that with, with, with some of the people who are concerned about the uh, upstairs uh, outdoor patio facility, rooftop facility. So with that, we're here for questions and we reserve any time for rebuttal. Thank you, and I do have questions from one of my constituents. So uh, at this time, we'll ask if there are any other proponents who wish to be heard. Any opponents? We'll close the public hearing. Um, so I received questions. I shared them with you. The um, a, a person who's involved uh, heavily in downtown uh, affairs and trying to improve downtown invested heavily in restoring the historic building, landmark building to the north of this and lives in that building, which would be, bedroom would be equal to where this outdoor <laughs> entertainment venue would Excuse is me, planned is to that, be. Is that to the south? To the north. To the north. To the north, right, excuse right. me, okay, gotcha. So he obviously had some concerns about what's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen, what it's gonna consist of, and would prefer there not be and would request to see if it's possible that you can start without an up-to-stairs outdoor deck and just have maybe a south uh, outdoor sidewalk uh, beer garden. But assuming that your business model contemplates otherwise, he, his secondary position was, well, is it possible we won't have any outdoor live music on the upstairs? Um, and that the whatever music there is would be turned off at, at 10 o'clock p.m. Um, on the outdoor venue. So, what say you? And I, I think we can we can turn, we have no problem turning off the music. We'd have a hard time closing it because people are up there and so on. But we can and the outside music is only planned to be piped in. It's not live music of any kind. So yes, we could do that. Okay. And I, I think one thing I think that he may not understand is there will be a mechanical room. This whole thing will change, so we'll and we will be way on the to the south right. of the building, closer to the police station. So we'll have them to monitor us in addition to anything else. So, uh, I, and of course, so you, when you when you add that plus the soundproofing and everything else that's going to come, plus there'll be a new alleyway there. So what his concerns were, primarily that I saw, 
are, are not founded on what's going to be there. Okay. And then what will be the hours for the upstairs deck? Even though you won't have music after 10 of any Give kind and there won't be any live music, what will the patrons be allowed to uh, be hanging out up there? Sure. Brianna Fom Carr. Um, planned hours of operation now are currently um, Tuesday through Saturday, um, and the hours would be uh, 4 p.m. until 1, 2 a.m. Okay. So that you'd still serve until the closing upstairs? Um, I can see that might be a noise concern for them, but um, any, anything you want to add to that? And I, I guess one thing, Mr. President, I would also say, you know, we have a noise, noise ordinance that works pretty good in this city, and we have to abide by that. As I said, we are as close to, to, to being monitored by the, by the police as you can get, so um, we, uh, we, will certainly, we will certainly have to abide by that, and we understand that. All right. So as I understand it, you're willing to add conditions, no live outdoor music on the deck upstairs, no uh, broadcast uh, music after 10 p.m., um, and that it's a tear down, rebuild, and the buffer for the mechanical systems and the soundproofing will be on the north side. Right. So the out, outdoor Correct. And we understand we have to get all the permits. We haven't right. got there because trying to get this permission okay. first. And you'll also be meeting with Mr. Emanuel to... We have been trying. We just have not... Yeah, and I know you have. Telephone tag, whatever. We right. haven't got it done yet. We're trying. And ha had there been more time and our time period to consider this, we probably would have laid this over a week to allow that to happen. But we're on a time constraint. Okay. We have to make a recommendation today or we lose the right to do so. Right. so um, is there a motion with those conditions? Any new permits? Any permits? Contingent upon permits? Is that your second? Any further discussion? Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. It's been recommended for approval with those conditions. Item 13, an application to consider in addition to Zesto, Black Beer, and Tables Class CKG liquor license located at 610 North 12th Street to add an area approximately 40 feet by 60 feet to the north. The public hearing on item 13 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Again, Mr. President, Mike Kelly, 2804 South 87th Avenue. Uh, you'll recall when we first opened uh, the Blatt downtown, we had a hat company in there called Lids. They ran their lease through seven years. They basically didn't renew. They basically moved their operation next door. And then uh, we tried another apparel company last year. They didn't renew. So we decided to turn it into a party room. We don't really have enough kitchen space to make it full-blown part of the Blatt, but we'll just make it a par party room. And we, w we do have it open for this wonderful series and we do have some great participants councilman um, and we'll have it open under a special designated permit for just for this year but then it will become a, a permanent part of the deal as far as a, a party room great place for a fundraiser by the way councilman now when you keep talking about the great entertainment why do you keep looking down that <laughs> they have the money <laughs> <laughs> that's fair <laughs> Are there any other proponents wishing to be heard? Any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Festerson? Yes. Gray? Yes. Harding? Yes. <laughs> Melton? Yes. Pauls? Palermo? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. I'm 13 is approved 7 to 0. Consent agenda. Any member of the city council may cause any item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from the consent agenda shall be taken up by the city council immediately following the consent agenda in the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by the city council rules of order. The public hearings on agenda items 14 through 23 were held on June 4, 2019. Council member Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I just wanted to take a second before moving approval of these items to highlight number 21 since we have the audience that we have here today. Um, we've talked about this before as a, as a city council last week, but um, I think it's pretty important to highlight one more time, and that is what will be the creation of a health, wellness, and crisis intervention unit within the Omaha Police Department. So I wanted to thank the um, Payroll Health Support Foundation and also Chief Schmader and the Police Department for their work on this. What it will do is embed behavioral health uh, professionals within each of our five police precincts and also establish for the first time a mental health coordinator within this health, wellness, and crisis intervention unit to serve within the police department and help serve those in crisis and experiencing behavioral health issues. And that's a huge issue when we talk about 
anything from health and wellness to law enforcement to juvenile justice and many other things. So I see it as a huge step forward and something I'm sure we can all agree upon. So just wanted to highlight that today and, and uh, move approval of these items. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. 14 through 23 are approved, 7 to 0. We're going to re remove item number 38. So it'll be 24 through 37. The public hearing on agenda items 24 through 37 begins at this time. If you wish to address the City Council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address, identify yourself by name, address, who you represent, and if you are a proponent or opponent. Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. 24 through 37 are approved, 7 to 0. The public hearing on item 38. You call it up? Um, actually, we're just requesting it be postponed oh. to the July 16th meeting. All right. Is there a motion? Motion to postpone to when? July 16th. July 16th. Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Melton, yes. Pauls, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Item 39, an ordinance to approve an agreement with Douglas County in the amount of $740,377 and to authorize funding for such agreement from the City of Omaha's Fiscal Year 2018 National Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Grant Award is amendment with the whole requested by the Mayor's Office. Is there a motion? Is that the amendment of the whole? Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Yes. Item 40, an ordinance levying a special tax and assessment on certain lots, parts of lots, and pieces of real estate to cover the cost of clearing snow and ice from sidewalks, group number 2018-02. The public hearing on item number 40 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Robert Boyd, City of Omaha Public Works, here to answer questions. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. I oh, don't I'm sorry. Come on down. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Berg, and I was, we were actually out of town for the the past hearing on the snow and ice, so I didn't get my uh, protest in on time, but uh, that's what I'm here for today, to oppose the, uh, the rather disproportionate assessment that we received for snow removal on one residential sidewalk, one time snow removal of $887 for one little stretch of sidewalk. So. Thank you. Any other opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 41, an ordinance to transfer $2,708,120 in the 2019 budget from the wage adjustment account to city departments. The public hearing on item 41 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? <coughs> any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 42, an ordinance to approve an agreement with Workforce Software LLC to purchase and implement Workforce Software Time and Attendance <coughs> System for a period of five years at a total cost of $895,000. The public hearing on item 42 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 43, an ordinance to accept the bid of Hyman Fire Equipment in the amount of $221,665.02 to provide 114 sets of personal protective equipment bunker gear for the Omaha Fire Department. The public hearing on item number 43 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, fire Chief, Chief Dan Olson, Omaha Fire Department, 1516 Jackson Street. I'm here as a proponent to the uh, ordinance number 43, PPE gear. Uh, this gear, as you know, is essential to our firefighting capabilities. It allows us to provide top-tier gear to the firefighters, which is the highest level of protection that we can afford to them. 
and um, it's a one-year contract and uh, we work very very hard to get this price into a reasonable range so that would not have a detrimental effect to our uh, general fund budget and um, I'm here to answer any questions that you may have thank you are there any other proponents wishing to be heard Uh, Frank Corcoran, uh, C-O-R, C-O-R-A, and Vice President, Omaha Professional Firefighters, 6005 Grover, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, 68106. Welcome. Uh, here's a proponent. Uh, I have to prepare everything. I'm not a great speaker. so <laughs> um, I want to thank you for the opportunity today to speak as a proponent for Agenda Item 43, uh, which, if adopted, will approve uh, the contract with Hyman, uh, fire equipment to provide a second set of gear for the Omaha firefighters, a key component of any plan uh, to reduce cancer in the fire service. In my 24 years in the fire service, um, it's been become more dangerous than most people really know. In fact, the number one cause of death among firefighters is not fire itself, but from occupational exposures to toxins and carcinogenic material at the fire scene and in the fire scenes. When firefighters attack structural fires, we are exposed to hazardous chemicals, including carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, benzene, styrene, formaldehyde, vinyl chlorides, just to name a few. All these chemicals can be found in household products that we see every day. A half century ago, furnishings in households were from raw materials such as wood, cloth, metal, glass. Uh, today, um, more products are made from these synthetic materials and it's becoming more dangerous for us. Um, they contain numerous carcinogens and toxins that when they burn make hundreds, make uh, the, the product a hundred times uh, more toxic. We're uh, routinely exposed to these toxic fumes, chemical substances, uh, when we respond to fires. Additionally, mixture of these chemicals is different at every fire with many substances acting as co-carcinogens with one another. The way all toxin, all toxic combustion byproducts interact makes firefighters' exposure uh, even more dangerous today than it was a half a century ago. Um, the risk is anecdotal. It's not empirical. Um, the risk is personal. In the city of Omaha, numerous firefighters have been diagnosed and treated for various cancers recently. Uh, two of our good friends, uh, just to name a couple, uh, have had their struggles with occupational cancer. In 2014, Captain Laura Larson succumbed to job-related ovarian cancer, making the ultimate sacrifice for the citizens of Omaha. We recognize her sacrifice every year at Colorado Springs at the Fallen Firefighters Memorial. We presently have fire apparatus engineer Laura Kitzman, who was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2018 after testing negative to all 43 genetic markers for breast cancer. She has since undergone a double mastectomy, reconstruction, and faces regular testing for cancer. Uh, we can recognize both Laura, Laura's today by adopting uh, uh, Resolution 43 and uh, approve the contract with Hyman Fire Equipment. Um, I'd also, uh, as uh, Chief Olson will uh, understand the uh, fire, fire, fire captain, Chad Kenny and the research he's done in the last five years for Omaha firefighters uh, to make it better and safer is appreciated. So as a pro I'm a proponent of uh, Resolution 43. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents wishing to be heard? Any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I think this is a serious issue, and I think it's important that we do all we can to ensure the health and welfare of our firefighters. Um, I want to thank Chief Olson for working on this, and uh, Mr. Corkin for being here and for his advocacy on it as well. Chief, if you don't mind, just a couple of follow-up questions. I know we talked a lot about this during the about this time last year during the budget cycle, and I'm pleased to see this moving forward, and we'll be supportive next week. This essentially ensures 
turnout gear for all frontline, a second set of turnout gear for all frontline firefighters, but there is more to come in your plan as well, right? That's correct, and uh, we appreciate your support in this quest moving forward to make sure that we can provide our firefighters with second sets of gear. This is an all-encompassing ordinance, however. This is going to cover not only our frontline gear that we use to replace ripped, torn, shredded gear that we, that we uh, suffer during our fire events when it becomes worn out. So this is an all-encompassing um, project, and this ordinance covers the gear that we're going to move forward with. What happened was our contract expired um, at the beginning of this year. So we were able to get the ball rolling and purchase uh, multiple sets of, of what I like to call uh, reserve sets of gear. Second sets of gear is a bad terminology in my opinion, but uh, what we're going to do is we're developing a policy where we're going to be uh, mandating rotation of the turnout gear. So if I were to deploy into a fire incident and become exposed to the products of combustion, as Frank relayed, they are harmful products, I will be able to uh, wash my gear in a, in a timely fashion and as that's taking place, I'll be able to don my second set of gear, my reserve set of gear. So we're going to mandate that this gear gets rotated uh, regularly by all members of the department, and that'll be done through policy. Uh, we're ahead of the ball um, in terms of our, our plan. It's a four-year plan breaking down uh, nearly 658 sets of turnout gear that's going to need to be purchased. We're able to put some capital dollars to work in 2019, and we have uh, surpassed our original goal and purchased uh, just over a quarter of the department's um, gear. Uh, we're going to continue with that quest this year by uh, continuing to use this ordinance to move forward with the uh, remainder of that uh, goal, the, uh, the original goal of purchasing just about a quarter uh, of the department's uh, number of turnout gear for that, uh, for that first phase of our project, which is a four-year plan. Great. Thank you. Thanks for adding that context, too. It's important sure. to know this isn't just the one-time thing, but we're going to keep working on it, and we all view it as an important thing to be pursuing. Um, I right. look forward to support it next week. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pauls. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Last spring, when I was uh, had a conversation with a number of firemen, this was really important to them because apparently there had been some resistance in the past of having this extra set of, uh, I'm going to call it an outfit, I, cause for lack of a better name, myself. And I'm glad to see that we have moved beyond that. And the thing that impressed me the most about it, because it was the individual, I spoke to a number of them, but one of them who was really driving this was not a younger person. He actually said he'd been a fireman so long, this actually may be too late for him, since he's been in so many uh, caustic places. But he did have the spirit of saying he's looking for those people who are younger than he or and she uh, they they were he was thinking about other people other than themselves so that really sold me on this concept and i am glad to see that we did through the both groups working together that uh, we will be able to vote on this in the next uh, budget thank you thank you Item 44, an ordinance to approve the fiscal year 2018 Choice Neighborhoods Implementation Grant Award in the amount of $25 million in a match and the amount of $157 million for a total program amount of $182 million during the project period from May 13, 2019 to September 30, 2025 to provide funding for the implementation of a transformation plan. The public hearing on item 44 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Good afternoon, Mr. President, Council Members, David Levy, Baird Home Law Firm, uh, 1700 Farnham Street, uh, actually appearing today as Chairman of the Board of Commissioners of the Omaha Housing Authority. I've got some company here with me, I can see, as well. So just a few quick things. Uh, first, I want to introduce our new uh, Executive Director and CEO, uh, Joni Poor. Some of you may be familiar with Joni or know her from her work in the community, but wanted to take this opportunity since we'd be up here today. Uh, we're thrilled to have her with us and, and really look forward to what she'll do with us uh, and for us at the Housing Authority. Uh, secondly, really just wanted to thank the city, our partners at 75 North, uh, the mayor's office, everybody who was a part of this effort to get this grant. It was really that partnership, I think, that impressed HUD and was a big part of the reason why we got this grant. So thank you very much. Thank you. Know. Anybody next, else? Next or if you have please. questions. Good afternoon, Sydney Franklin with 75 North, if there are any um, questions. 
Yes, and thank you. Bill Lucas, Omaha Planning Department, here for the same reason, answer questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Amy, uh, Council Member Melton. Well, thank you. Well, and I just think it, it would be important. We've all talked about it. But if somebody would like to stand up, maybe, and talk about the impact that this money is going to have in our community and give some sp specifics for people that maybe were unaware unaware of, of what, you know, this sure. this HUD grant will do. Yep. So, again, uh, good afternoon. Sydney Franklin with 75 North. I serve as our Chief Operating Officer. Uh, the premise for this grant submittal is to um, begin building off of some of the successes that um, this choice neighborhood impact area's neighboring neighborhood, Highlander, um, has experienced some successes over the last uh, few years. Um, investments that we've made in mixed income housing, investments we've made in um, education, ad advancing the educational institutions in our neighborhood, as well as attracting uh, collegial partners in Creighton University and Metropolitan Community, Community College and satellite campuses, and then also attracting what we call um, health and wellness amenities uh, to this one neighborhood in a, a, a boundary geographic area. The idea is to expand that north, 75 north, using the purpose-built communities model, which is a, a nationally renowned model for community development. Uh, we have a focus on um, Howard Kennedy Elementary School, which is about five uh, blocks north of, of Highlander. Um, where we focused our developments in housing um, and also health and wellness amenities. Another kind of idea for this CNI grant is to um, serve as a connector between Highlander and Howard Kennedy as well as uh, Spencer Homes, which will become Kennedy Square per the grant application. So um, this $25 million will also be leveraged into over $150 million in um, philanthropic support, support from the City of Omaha, through CDBG funds um, and other sources of funding. So, Bill, did that about cover it? That's perfect. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I think it's just it's so wonderful what you're doing. I just wanted to thank highlight you. some some of this and thank you for your thank you for your work and and thank you as well. So, thank you for your partnership. All right. Thanks, Mr. Festerson. Thanks, Mr. President. I also just wanted to thank Mr. Lukash for his work on this. Uh, he reported to the planning committee for. I don't know, a couple of years on this consortium of partners and the work towards getting this grant. And it was a lot of work and it was super competitive. And $25 million is a big deal. I, I see it as phase two of 75 North, which has already been tremendously <laughs> successful and a game changer for this neighborhood. And so I know you're working on uh, some additional ideas. So hopefully we can go out and get another one sometime soon. Uh, that's my <laughs> hope as well. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Mr. Harding. Thank you, Mr. President. Nice teaser, uh, Mr. Festerson. <laughs> Um, I, one, one highlight I wanted to point out too is, and Ms. Franklin talked about it, is that not only is this what we have received in the form of a grant from HUD of the $30 million, but it's what has been leveraged off of that that I think really speaks volumes to our community. And to turn $30 million and leverage that with another $157, $157 million for over $180 million is, is quite a statement to what this community can really do when it pulls together. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. Yes. Item 45, an ordinance to approve an agreement with the Nebraska Preparedness Partnership in the amount of $45,000 and to authorize the funding for such agreement from the fiscal year 2018 State Homeland Security Grant Award to provide enhanced security of critical infrastructure assets. The public hearing on item 45 begins at this time. Are there any proponents? Any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item 46, an ordinance approving the 17th supplemental agreement with Douglas County and the Omaha Douglas Public Building Commission to provide for the issuance of up to 114 million of new bonds to pay costs related to justice facilities and juvenile detention facilities as an addition to the Civic Center and as an addition to the Hall of Justice. Thank you. Before we call and open the public hearing, I just want to let people know, um, because of the number of people here today to testify, it's important that we be fair to all who wish to speak, so we'll have the light system. You'll have three minutes to speak. When you, uh, that time will speak after you introduce your name and address. There will be a green light indicating your time has begun, then a yellow light when you have one minute left, and a red light when your time has expired. 
if you have written comments you don't need to worry about getting in all of those you can just hand them to our city clerk and they'll be made a part of the record i'm going to open we have a we have people who have signed in to speak if you have not signed in and wish to speak they still have signed yes there's still a sign-in sheet outside if you wish to uh, be heard, either as a proponent or opponent. Please make sure you sign in, then they'll route the sheets to me. As our first um, proponent, we have, I believe it's Mr. Lemke from HDR. Nineteen seventeen South 67th Street. Uh, thank you for your time this afternoon, Mr. President, Council Members. Uh, my pleasure to be here to present uh, thoughts on the uh, Juvenile Justice Center for Douglas hey, County. Thank you. Is that is that better? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Today, yes, we're not going to have cat calls from the audience. We're going to maintain decorum, <laughs> and so part of the rules of the council are there's no applauding, there's no shouting or heckling, and things like that. And I appreciate the audio point. Uh, if anyone else has difficulties hearing, please come down and let the clerk know. We'll let the building commission know. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna to try to lean in and speak uh, loudly, so hopefully that works. Um, so we start this project, we, we put together uh, some guiding principles to take us through the entire project. And the first guiding principle is that the, the juvenile space, uh, the, the county space needs for juvenile courts is really apparent. Uh, the courts are out of room. Um, they're, they're already squeezed into their things, so we need to expand, and that's kind of an obvious uh, thing that needs to happen. The next point is to really improve the juvenile justice system with a transformative design to serve the children and their families. And this is something that uh, our firm has a lot of experience in. We've been doing this uh, for many decades, and we've seen the results, that we can actually change lives. Uh, it's the entire program together. The building is just one component of that. And then a third, third idea, is to uh, have a facility that inspires civic pride. Uh, these are our kids, uh, and, and sometimes we have challenges, and we need to address those challenges uh, straight up, and so we want to make sure that we provide the best facility for that to happen. Uh, the next slide kind of shows how this whole thing um, is organized. Uh, we have systems oversight with, with uh, the youth center, um, and, and we have an expediter that's been hired we have uh, coordinated planning efforts between the Omaha Police Department, the judges, the attorney's probation. We have policy and practice consultants. Uh, we have policies and statutes. And this July 1st, I believe LB 112, uh, changes the provisions for the juveniles that can be and cannot be and what they can be held for and not in the detention facility. And then we have housing services, Child Savings Institute. We've heard about this in the past couple of weeks, how we've already been serving some of our youth by going to there first. Uh, all the research points to the fact that the less time and no time, if possible, that youth can spend in the juvenile detention facility is best for the youth, it's best for the family, and in the long run, it's best for our entire community. So wrapped around all of this and to serve all of this is the building, the physical structure. And so it's really just a container, but putting everything in one location, co-locating, making sure that the youth and their families have immediate access, a much more efficient system will help the youth be in the system for a much shorter period of time. And as I pointed out before, uh, all of the parties benefit. The composition of the uh, project is, is a judicial tower, approximately 140,000 square feet, um, eight stories, community programs, court support, public defender. Uh, the MUD building, uh, the plan is to leave that in place. Um, it's a nice old building. And to uh, do a restoration on the interior to accommodate probation and some community service programs. The youth center. Uh, about 60,000 square feet, four stories, and this will uh, have rooms for 64 finished beds. Uh, the Chin Report um, established 48 beds as the required number, and we see that trend coming as well. Uh, we see that number as a solid number, but we think the 64 is a good safety valve. And then a skywalk connection uh, between the facilities. Uh, project amenities, um, full-size high school gym, uh, health facilities, libraries, uh, all that in the youth center. I'm going to let you kind of read through those. I'm just going to zip through these. I want to be mindful of the time. 
Uh, the site plan, the, the notion that we have at the top, kind of center, the existing Hall of Justice, and then the dark gray shaded areas, we have the, uh, the Justice Center located in this position, the Youth Center here, MUD, all surrounded by a courtyard with connectivity, direct connectivity between the Youth Center and the Justice Center, very important critical component of this project, and then the sky bridge to the uh, north connecting it to the Hall of Justice. This diagram shows how the floors stack up in the tower, attorneys on top, courts on floors three and four, community and lobby areas on the first floor. In the youth center, the lobby and intake on ground floor, housing on the next two floors, uh, some images of the courtyard space from the exterior, the youth center, the interior. Thank you. Your time has expired. Thank you. Mr. Here for any questions. Yes. Mr. Uh, we'll have county commissioners wish to be heard next. Uh, Commissioner Boyle. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, members of the City Council, my name is Mike Boyle. I reside at 1027 Marcy Plaza, Unit 201 in the Old Market. I'm also a member of the Douglas County Board, representing uh, Southeast Omaha, Douglas County. and. Uh, as of today, just reappointed to the Building Commission, but not as a favor. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be very brief because uh, <laughs> I wanted to, to express support for this uh, uh, facility, and uh, I had a lot of questions, and I led the opposition on the Building Commission, uh, and I voted, to, I voted no to postpone and to stall the project several months ago. And uh, your representatives from the City Council joined with me, so they, my motion prevailed and the project was stalled. And during that time, uh, I asked an awful lot of questions. I got a lot of phone calls, but I got a lot, a lot of information and some changes took place that were, I think, were very important. And the changes are diversion. Our young people, our neighbors, our children's children, our own children, if they're arrested, they won't necessarily be taken to the juvenile justice center, the detention center. They could be taken to the Omaha Home for Boys. There's beds there for them. The uh, Utah Holly Home for Girls, there's beds for girls there. The Child Saving Institute on 46th and Dodge for children who are suffering trauma. There are, alt are alternatives so they will never enter and that operation has already been used. So uh, it is working. And uh, the changes that have occurred um, changed my mind. In addition to that, we are so fortunate to have the uh, Sherwood Foundation as a financial backer who's really helping us. Their heart is in the right place and we're so fortunate to have them and other people who will contribute to make this a success. This is a project for our children. That's the bottom line. They need help, they need mental health services, and they need to be diverted. They should never go to that center if they don't need to. So please support this. This is a good, reasonable alternative for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponent county commissioners who wish to be heard? My name is Mark Kraft. I'm one of the county commissioners. And the county approved this issue today, six to one. This building was funded through these, this plan in 1974 or 75. Without this type of state authorized revenue bond, we would not be able to have had this building. And it was intended for use as we are planning to use it. Um, you're going to hear a lot of opponents talking about better, cheaper, wiser, or better, cheaper, faster. They like to use three-letter words. Mine is ill-advised, ill-informed, and under a false narrative. And I could repeat it like one of my opponent friends does 31 times, but I'm not going to. Um, the argument is ba based on half-truths and false pretenses. Uh, as far as neighborhood development, I hope I have his name right, Royce Maynard from DICON, had an article in the paper. It was a small article. He's doing the Frieden Building right across the street from the correctional facilities. And he said, nobody asked him. He said, they have a view of the wet razor wire. 
and it hasn't affected it. My business was at 16th and Leavenworth, right across from the correctional facility. When it first went up, I had concerns. You want to know something? I was rarely asked about it. And when I was, it was, what's with the razor wire on that building? What is it? And when I explained it, it didn't bother anybody. My parents lived across the street, and we had no trouble selling their house to Patrick Dick Dricky, where he has a very nice art gallery called 1516. And I do mean nice, very upscale. Um, you're going to be told that remodeling the current facility is wiser, better. It's not. It could cost a lot more. And what do you do with the youth while you're trying to remodel that facility? You have somebody who in there on construction whose son or grandson or nephew is there. It can create security things. And boy, three minutes sure goes facts. The tax increase. Whether it goes to a public vote or whether we do it through this proven method, there's going to be a tax increase. It's going to be about nine-tenths of a mill for the county courthouse part and two-tenths of a mill for the juvenile detention part. So that's 1.1 mil. Other alternatives we have, lease to own, remodeling, could cost us much more than that. Uh, a vote of the people is a delay. It sounds great. It sounds great, but it's a delay. And if it fails, what do we do? There's a cost to acting and a cost to not acting. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other proponent commissioners wish to be heard? Seeing none, uh, Paul Cohen, Building Commission. Paul Cohen, your administrator, Omaha Douglas Public Building Commission. I guess I didn't know I had signed in as a proponent because I don't think I did. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. There are plenty of other people here who can speak Thank to you. the issue as a proponent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brad Ashford. Uh, thank you, members. Brad Ashford, 7926 Shirley, Omaha, Nebraska. Just a brief statement, and I realize it's the time constraints. <clears throat> the challenges for the juvenile justice system are immense. In Douglas County and elsewhere, there is a disproportionate number of youth of color in the system. Our facilities for juveniles are old and in significant need of replacement. Our youth who offend as juveniles are much more likely to offend as adults. The human and economic cost of these and other challenges are not going away despite years and decades of trying. The issues connected with the reform of the juvenile justice system have been an extremely high priority for me for the 16 years, and Rich will know, the 16 years I served in the unicameral and as executive director of the Omaha Housing Authority. While chair of the Judiciary Committee, we passed LB5. 61, which contained significant reforms to the juvenile justice system focused on alternatives to incarceration and early identification of youth who are most likely to offend. We have made progress. Rates of incarceration in the youth center have dramatically decreased, as is the case with state facilities in Kearney and Geneva, while violence has in fact declined in the community. This is not a coincidence. It is the result of coordinated efforts of the juvenile courts, state probation, schools, law enforcement, the county attorney, the city of Omaha, not-for-profits, and others. Based on my experience, I strongly believe that this project will make a significant difference as we also commit to the development, funding, and operation of evidence-based programs for juveniles. Currently, I have been advising Burlington Capital and other donors on what I think should be done. It is my belief that the developers of the Juvenile Justice Center and the donor community who support the project understand fully that a building without programs and goals for success is simply a building. This project is much more. It is a platform for collaboration and coordination of services, it provides space for families and advocates, and advocates to interact, and it has been designed, as you heard, 
to incorporate advancements in the design of such facilities across the country. Thankfully, detention has decreased in Douglas County. However, we must have a safe and secure youth center that meets the highest standards for juvenile facilities, as I believe this project does. This project has already helped fuel discussions for a new juvenile mental health facility and additional alternatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Next proponent is Thomas Warren, Urban League. Welcome, Chief. Next up is Dr. Mark Foxall, if you could be ready. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the Omaha City Council, Thomas Warren. I serve as President, Chief Executive Officer at the Urban League of Nebraska, 3040 Lake Street. I also had the privilege of serving this community for 24 years with the Omaha Police Department, the last four as Chief of Police before retiring in 2008. I currently serve as co-chair of the Douglas County Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative and also serve on the steering committee for Operation Youth Success, which are juvenile justice reform efforts. But I'm here today speaking only on behalf of the Urban League and my support of the Building Commission's resolution for the Justice Center and the Juvenile Detention Facility. At the Urban League, we administer programs in education and youth development employment and career services, and we are a traditional civil rights organization advocating for social justice related issues, including education reform, child welfare reform, and juvenile justice reform. We administer our community coaches program where we work directly with youth who are under the supervision of the juvenile justice system, where we offer an effective intervention strategy to divert or re redirect those youth from going further into the system. As I mentioned, I've been involved in these juvenile justice reform efforts uh, for several years, and I am convinced that Douglas County is now willing to implement many of the best practices and reform efforts that will lead to better outcomes for youth. The juvenile justice system is premised on the notion of rehabilitation, and also best practices suggest that the juvenile justice system should prescribe the least restrictive form of supervision in order to preserve public safety. As a former police officer, I am well aware of the fact that we have violent youthful offenders, and that is who the juvenile detention facility is designed for. However, I'm also aware of the fact that there are a significant number of low to moderate risk youth who are confined because of the lack of viable alternatives. Each day that a youth who doesn't need to be confined it is in detention it has a detrimental effect on their personal growth and social development. As you may know and has been mentioned, it was actually the implementation of LB 1112 that changed the criteria for detaining youth. Uh, specifically, we have a number of youth who are confined at the Douglas County Youth Center for technical violations, including loss of placement. We also have youth who run from placement facilities, which has been considered placing them in harm's way. But as of July 1st, 2019, youth will no longer be detained solely for the loss of placement or harm to self. There have been questions about the appropriate number of beds that we would be sufficient for the new facility and if 64 would be enough. I need since, to wrap up, Chief. Okay, since we've implemented uh, the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, uh, we reduced the juvenile detention uh, population by over 50%. Thank you. And I think that with additional reforms, you will continue to see a decline in the juvenile detention population. Thank you. Feel free to have your, the rest of your remarks, if any, entered into the record. Yes, Dr. You. Mark Thank Foxall. You. Yes. West. I, I, I think, um, I, I know we have a lot of people who would like to speak, but I, I also think that um, some of the testimony in, in maybe three minutes might not be enough. And I, I'd be, um, I don't know if you need a motion or something, but I, I, I would like to see if we could expand that time period um, rather than cut them off in the, in the middle of the, the remarks when they hit that, the end of the three minutes. So if, I'd like to extend it to 
five or your, use your discretion to let them kind of finish up. But I, I think this is important information, both from proponents as well as opponents. And I, I think it's important for the community to get more of the information. Thank you. Once, of course, uh, I think we'll exercise my discretion uh, unless there's a motion. And to the extent we're trying to be fair to both sides, and when you have somebody who gets to speak and then they think the chair let one person speak more than the other, then the, someone who was maybe on the other side of the issue then feels they weren't given the same uh, treatment. So as the council members will recall, we all have the ability at the conclusion of the public hearing to call anyone up for questions and answers or additional comments. Um, but let's see how it goes and, and if there's... Um, Absolutely. Okay. I, I think I heard you say, unless someone makes a motion. So I'll, I'll make a motion that we extend um, the time period to five minutes. That's my Second. motion. Any further discussion? Roll call. Pastor said. Can we discuss? That's why I was looking for lights. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mr. Palermo. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I, I guess my question is, and I don't have a problem hearing anybody out. Obviously, we want to get as much information that we haven't already got from everybody already. Uh, but if, if we do vote uh, to extend this uh, to five minutes, uh, I want to make sure that those who have already spoke will get a chance to come up to possibly finish or add on. That would be my only comment. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Festers. Yeah, thanks. I, th I think for that same making that same point, I don't think we can change midstream here, but I don't object to others having questions at the end um, or having additional information at that point. But I think we need to keep it um, consistent at this point and have the chair use his discretion to let people finish their remarks. But um, that's why I would vote no on this motion. Thank you. Roll call. Festerson. No. Gray. No. Harding. Yes. Melton. Yes. Pauls. Palermo? Yes. Mr. President? No. Motion failed three to four. Mr. Fox, Dr. Fox. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harding. Thank you very much. I have 16 weeks of a three hour, one night a week lecture in my head that I was prepared to give you <laughs> pursuant to your discussion, but in my new life as a university prof, but I'll keep it to three minutes. So, uh, Dr. Mark Foxall, and Community Service Associate, University of Nebraska at Omaha, 6001 Dodge Street. However, today I am in my capacity as a private citizen. As you know, I'm the recently retired director of the Douglas County Department of Corrections, the, and I've said this on many occasions, largest mental health facility in the state of Nebraska. We're booking approximately 19 to 20,000 people a year, 1,500 a month in, about 1,500 a month out. And so got a little bit of experience in the incapacitation department. Uh, this conversation should be more than just about brick, mortar, and rebar, okay? Frederick Douglass once said that it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And my 38 years of experience and started out with chief over there in the Omaha Police Department, that quote is right on point. Mass incapacitation is a very monolithic approach to a very complex, multifaceted problem in our community. Poverty concentrates, concentrates people particularly of color and that concentration of poverty leads to social isolation. That resulting isolation leads to poor access to health care, poor access to mental health care, poor access to education, employment, and a myriad of other opportunities that could help people escape or avoid the multi-generational cycle of offending and victimization. And I highlight that point of victimization. We often think about criminal and crime in terms of offending and offensive behavior, but in these neighborhoods that are beset by crime and violence, there are an awful lot of victims, an awful lot of victims. If we have a chance to co-locate an array of programming, services, providers, criminal justice practitioners that are best suited to collectively meet the needs of a specific population of juveniles, many of whom have dealt with trauma, been victims long before they were offenders, then this project should move forward. Otherwise, if incapacitation is to be the preferred choice of service delivery, then funding for incapacitation facilities vis-a-vis -vis juvenile, adult, and prisons needs to be provided. Relationships and partnerships, I've seen the measurable outcomes, 
positive measurable outcomes of measurable of, of these relationships and partnerships when the criminal justice practitioners and members of the communities get in the room and they seek really good solutions to very complex problems. I served on the uh, uh, a committee that brought together all of those folks from the city council to the mayor's office, the county attorney to public defender's office, police department, sheriff's office, and that multi-jurisdictional <coughs> approach to solving issues, I think, is very workable and has certainly proven itself. I think this process is headed down that road, and if we can get like-minded people in the room to address these complex problems, I think then we will also have successful, positive outcomes. Thank you. Deborah Neary. Next up, Deb Denbeck. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Deborah Neary at 7522 Shirley Street, and uh, I am an elected member of our State Board of Education, but I'm not here in that capacity. I'm here as the CEO of a nonprofit called Mentor Nebraska that provides diversion opportunities for youth that have touched the juvenile justice system, and I've been in this work for 10 years. I'll leave a letter uh, from our organization uh, in support of this, but there's a couple of points I want to quick make. Some of you might remember back in 2013 in the front page of the newspaper there were the headlines that Nebraska had one of the highest juvenile lockup rates in the country, which was certainly not a distinction that we should have been proud of. For all those years prior, all the other states except for three of us that were in that uh, uh, area were decreasing the number of youth that were incarcerating because that's what best practice practices and what all the research said should be happening. And there has been a lot of work done since then with the Douglas County, and I really give credit to uh, Commissioner Borgeson and Commissioner Rogers and all of the commissioners for the work and emphasis they've put. And while there has been a lot of improvement in diversion programs and intervention programs, we still, and this is research from two years ago that I want to quote from, uh, there's a site called the Burns Institute for Ju Juvenile Justice, Fairness, and Equity. And here in Omaha, it quotes that for every one white youth that is in a youth detention center, we have 13 black youth that are incarcerated. And that uh, shows that there's so many problems with our juvenile justice system to this day, even though we've had a lot of improvements. And it shows that we there's tremendous bias and that we are causing damage and that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Now, I want to switch hats to now as a personal, uh, this is my personal commentary as a foster mom to eight youth and a parent, uh, foster parent who's had to uh, be in the uh, DCYC on behalf of my youth and how that detention center impacted my youth, who uh, my foster youth, who had been throat so much in her life, but she was so successful at the time. We had her in a private school. She got in trouble, made a bad choice, was in the detention center for one week, and she came out a completely changed person and not for the better. As somebody who's read a ton of research about school climate and our school education systems, there's so much research out there that says if we change school climate and if we change the atmosphere of our schools, then we're going to change the achievement outcomes for our youth. And the same goes for uh, things like our juvenile justice system and the buildings that they go to. The last point I want to make is as a parent, we need to make it easier for our parents to come and be supportive of their youth when they've gotten in trouble. Having the court system next to the areas where other decisions are going to be made, that is just an absolute necessity. We have to think that so many of these youth that are being impacted by the juvenile justice youth are living in poverty, and their parents who are having trouble getting time off from work anyway. And I just believe this juvenile justice system center is so important to our community, and I really appreciate uh, your listening today, and I hope that you will vote to support the bond. Thank you. Thank you. Deb? Denbeck. Next up is Nick Giuliano. Giuliano. Good afternoon. My name is Deb Denbeck. I'm the president of Partnership for Kids, a preventive youth serving organization here in Omaha. I reside at 12303 Rose Lane. This is an initiative that is very important to all of the youth and many of the youth that we serve. I believe 
that it's time for us as a city to invest early. If we don't invest early, we do pay later. And as taxpayers and citizens of Omaha, we don't have a choice when that becomes that pay later situation. I believe all of these young people are our future leaders and we need to help all of them. What a great opportunity that we have right now for our private, our public, and our philanthropic areas to all hold hands and walk together to make a difference for our youth. We specifically had a student who was in our program that ended up spending six weeks in detention. Six weeks. And he is an absolute mess right now because there was not preventive programming for him. We cannot allow that to continue to happen. I'm still mentoring this young man, and he's still yet to, to have his high school degree because he's so traumatized and has so many other issues. We are serving. It is costing us more. And every time that we incarcerate a youth, it takes away hope. When hope goes away, they're going to get in more trouble. So let's start building hope in our youth. Also, many of these young people are growing up in poverty. Poverty has traumatized so many of our youth. So we need to have this great programming that this program is having. I ask all of you to invest early and invest in this program. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Giuliano. Next up is Josh Henningsen. Good afternoon. Nick Giuliano. I'm here today on behalf of Boys Town. I'm the Director of Regional Advocacy and Public Policy, 13603 Flanagan Boulevard. Uh, you should have in your packet a letter of support from Father Stephen Bays, our National Executive Director. And I'm here to testify in support of the Justice Center project. We feel this project represents an important and necessary component of the larger juvenile justice reform that's been discussed here today. And the proposed Juvenile Justice Center co-locates significant aspect of our juvenile justice system and ensures that our community will have safe and modern facilities well into the future. For more than 100 years, Boys Town has been helping children and families in the Omaha community. In 2018, more than 95 percent of the services provided by Boys Town were prevention services and alternatives to detention to help keep the youth in this community at home, attending school, and out of trouble. One of the reasons we're supporting the Juvenile Justice Center project is because it complements the broader multi-year juvenile justice reform efforts in Douglas County, many of which have been discussed, Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative, Operation Youth Success, Youth Impact, as well as significant growth in the capacity for community-based services and alternatives to detention. In addition, you're aware there's a companion program separate from the Justice Center, which will bring online 18 to 20 mental health and substance abuse beds to help to serve those young people who are in detention, awaiting treatment. Uh, on a personal level, I'll be transitioning from my role at Boys Town next week to help stand that program up and continue to be part of building that capacity here in Douglas County. So. Um, thank you for your time today. We look forward to continue working with all the partners here on our juvenile justice system. Thank you. Mr. Henningsen. Next up is Pastor L.D. Richardson, Sr. Uh, I'm Josh Henningsen, 5113 Franklin Street. Uh, I'm here today in my personal capacity, but I work for the legislature as legal counsel for the Judiciary Committee, uh, and juvenile justice has been one of my main uh, subject matter areas of responsibility. Uh, I'd like to focus a little bit on the detention center uh, with a modern design, a smaller capacity, and co-located with other parts of the juvenile justice system and how that fits in a larger context of <clears throat> juvenile justice reform in Nebraska. Reform has been ongoing in Nebraska for some time, but current efforts can largely be traced back to LB 561 in 2013. The most high-profile change in this bill was to take supervision responsibilities that were split between DHHS and probation and consolidate those under probation. The theory was that increased efficiency would allow decisions to be made based on the needs of individual juveniles and not unnecessary financial or structural considerations. Co-locating as much of the juvenile justice system as possible in this new complex is right in line with the same principle. 
The time spent waiting for someone across town to return a phone call or respond to an email or make arrangements for a youth in a detention center is unnecessary time that youth spends in detention. LB 562 also reworked what is now called the Community-Based Juvenile Services Aid Program. The bill increased funding from about a million dollars to seven million dollars with the intention to eventually get up to ten million dollars. The bill prioritized grants focused on diversion, reducing detention, and helping youth transition from out-of-home placements. LB 561 created dedicated staff at the Crime Commission to help counties implement and maintain effective pretrial diversion programs and alternatives to detention. It also created dedicated staff at the Crime Commission and an evaluation program at UNO's Juvenile Justice Institute to one, make sure that the county programs funded by the grants are evidence-based and data-driven, and two, to provide technical assistance to replicate and implement successful programs across the state. What we have learned from the researchers at UNO is that Douglas County is over-reliant on detention. We send too many kids to detention and we keep them there too long. We've also learned that there are effective programs and strategies to reduce the use of detention without putting public safety at risk. Because we have excess detention capacity, detention is often the path of least resistance. It's easier to send a youth to detention or keep them there rather than pursue potential alternatives. There's a lot of other bills that followed LB 561, but the motivation of all of them has been the same. Implement evidence-based and data-driven programs to limit system involvement and reduce the use of detention and out-of-home placement. This project is an important part of juvenile justice reform here in Omaha, and I would encourage you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Richardson. Next up, Juliet Summers. Good afternoon. I'm Pastor L.D. Richardson, Sr. from the Mount Zion Community Church on 31st and Q. I also am the chairman of the South Omaha Violence Intervention and Prevention Community Partnership. 2475 Deer Park Boulevard. I would like to just share my thoughts about the Douglas County Justice Center project proposal, please. And let me begin by reminding everyone that the existing Hall of Justice was built more than 100 years ago. And today, Douglas County's justice-related services and functions have expanded beyond this building's capacity. The Douglas County Justice Center project proposal represents a thoughtful plan to address this shortfall. And I strongly support this project. And I encourage all of you to support it too for the following reasons. It will offer optimal size and adequate facilities at the appropriate downtown location. It will create the right conditions and environment for a more effective and efficient judicial process and reform. It will facilitate a collaborative process and coordination of the services to improve justice outcomes and increase safety for our entire community. I believe the Douglas County Justice Center project proposal will help to establish our community as a leader in juvenile justice practices that protect youth and families and increase safety for everyone in this community. I support the supplemental agreement among the City of Omaha the County of Douglas, the Omaha Douglas Building Commission to provide for the issuance of $114 million of new bonds to pay costs for the Douglas County Justice Center project proposal. And I'm offering my strong support for this proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Summers, before you begin, I would remind people if you wish to speak as a proponent or opponent, there's a sign-in sheet outside and please do so. Ms. Summers. Good afternoon, Mr. President, uh, members of the council. My name is Juliette Summers. I reside at 216 South 86th Street, and I'm here uh, representing Voices for Children in Nebraska, where I'm the policy coordinator for child welfare and juvenile justice. Um, I'm submitting written testimony that speaks to sort of the broader courtroom design, but in the interest of time, I will also focus, uh, focus my remarks on the juvenile detention aspect. Um, decades of research tells us that incarcerating kids and teens is harmful rather than helpful. Um, jailing teens, though it may feel like safety uh, in an immediate moment, actually does the opposite um, by increasing recidivism, both in juvenile and criminal proceedings, by decreasing educational attainment and longer-term educational attainment, by worsening mental health and increasing the likelihood of suicide. Um, as you've heard, Nebraska and Omaha have taken steps in recent years to reduce our numbers of incarcerated youth, um, and it has been a steady decline, particularly over the past few years. Um, and notably, at the same time, the data also showed that juvenile crime has continued to drop. 
Um, as you've heard, uh, we still have challenges to undertake, and particularly as regards disproportionality by race and ethnicity in our juvenile system. Um, but there are additional upcoming legislative changes that we hope will continue us on this improved path for our young people. Um, in Omaha, Douglas County, our current juvenile detention facility was built in the 1990s, and it looks like a high security prison. Um, it's the opposite of a welcoming environment to give kids place there a sense of security as they await their rehabilitative plans in juvenile court. Uh, it has limited parking. Um, it's convenient to only a couple bus lines, which can make visitation for families challenging. It's also a drive from the courthouse, um, which means kids are likely to get fewer and less immediate in-person visits from their lawyers because of the time involved from getting da from downtown between court hearings to 42nd and Center. Um, and I failed to note at the outset that I'm also a former juvenile public defender, so I have some experience of trying to fit in those visits. And unfortunately, all too often it doesn't happen if you're stuck in court. Um, a reason that we support this resolution today is because the proposed design um, will be an improvement on the status quo in those regards. Um, the secure facility is right there by the courthouse so that children detained pending their juvenile case uh, don't have to be transported. They have more frequent and immediate in-person visits from attorneys. It should be easier for families to access. More bus lines go there. Um, and it can be built entirely fresh with trauma-informed principles of design. Fewer detention beds will mean it's reserved for youth who present an immediate danger and not um, you know, a, a longer-term uh, rehabilitative question. Um, I want to close by saying that obviously the new buildings alone don't solve systemic issues, but transformational building design is an important piece of transforming how the system functions. Um, for all those reasons, I think this presents an opportunity to rethink how our system both looks and functions for our children and to make an improvement. Um, and I thank you for your time. I have to pick up kids from daycare, so I, unfortunately I don't think I can stay till the end to answer questions, but I'd be happy to answer any if you have some for me right now. Thank you. Joel Cota. Next up, Eric Bergen. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Joel Cota. Um, I'm a member of the South Omaha Violence Intervention and Prevention for the last seven years, 2475 Deer Park Boulevard. And I've been working in the South and North Omaha community for the last 21 years. Um, I just want to express uh, respectfully a few thoughts about this program. Uh, we are aware that many studies show that youth crime and youth incarceration in Douglas County have declined significantly over the past 10 years. As a result, a smaller youth center like the one in this proposal would both meet the needs of the county and reduce costs for taxpayers. In addition, many of our low-income families in South and North Omaha have, that have a family member in, the, in a detention center lack transportation and often even the money to pay for the cost of a taxi to go and visit her or him. A downtown co-located facility, like the one on the Douglas County Center project proposal, will ease that burden. I strongly support this co-located Douglas County Justice Center project proposal because I believe that when facilities are focused on alternatives to detention, they produce positive benefits for the juvenile the family of the juvenile and the entire community. The proposed Douglas County Justice Center project will, as recommend by best practices in juvenile justice, co locate significantly aspects of the juvenile system in one place. I support the supplemental agreement among the City of Omaha, the County of Douglas, and the Omaha Douglas Public Building Commission to provide for the issuance of $114 million of new bonds to pay for costs for the Douglas County Justice Center project proposal. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes a lot of courage to dream big. I strongly support the Douglas County Justice Center project proposal and the change makers behind these ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bergen. Next up, Christine Henningsen. City Council people. Uh, county commissioners, I want to thank everybody and the people that have spoke up for this pro this project. First of all, I, it hits me from the heart for the simple reason. I deal with a lot of kids and parents who don't have the transportation to get back and forth to have these meetings they have to go to or go see a lawyer or go see a therapist somewhere out west. And like I say, most of them, if they're on the bus line, they can't get there in time for, to keep up their appointments. So they're being penalized through the system for not being able to keep up with all their appointments. 
this is the best thing they could ever do is put everything in one spot. You know, our kids deserve this. It's not a black thing. It's not a white thing. It's about our kids. And I, I work with all types. I deal with Hispanics. I deal with Caucasian. I deal with blacks. I deal with everybody. And I have took parents out of town to go see their kids in another state because our state can't equip them or handle the situation where they have to go to for mental health to another state. I don't understand that part. With all the changes that are coming about now, I see that this is going to be something that's going to benefit the whole city. It's going to beautify downtown, too. I heard people complain about it's going to make it ugly and all. I can't tell. All I see is beautiful, and it's everything that has been going on. Everybody I have been talking Mr. Doyle, my heart just almost dropped today when he said he, he was for this project because I didn't heard him speak so much against it. And now for him to change his mind, I have, man, I believe in the system. I believe it's going to change. So on that note, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. Name and address for the record, Mr. Bergen. Uh, 5904 Hennings Drive. Eric Bergen, right? Eric Bergen. Thank you. Christine Henningsen. And next up is Mary Vysick. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Henningsen. I live at 5113 Franklin Street here in Omaha. Um, I'm here in my personal capacity today, but I also work at UNL's Center on Children, Families, and the Law. I direct a project there called Nebraska Youth Advocates, which trains uh, juvenile defense attorneys across the state and also works towards policy changes in line with best practices in juvenile justice. Um, I'm here in support of the proposal before you. I think our juvenile justice system needs to be driven by a few different principles. Um, we need a system that's efficient and also one that's effective. The co-location of the detention center with the courthouse goes a long way towards that efficiency uh, factor. Uh, Councilmember Melton, I think you talked at the building commission that in Ramsey County, they indicated like the building doesn't really matter. Um, I think they were referencing more the brick and the mortar. I think they would say the location does, right? We've talked a lot about the inefficiencies of transportation of youth uh, to court in shackles for their court hearings. And Ms. Summers talked about some of the inefficiencies in that attorney-client relationship. Um, part of our project, we did a survey of youth at DCYC around aspects of procedural justice. Some of that was interactions with their attorney. Of the 89 youth that we surveyed, only 85% even knew that they had an attorney. 11% weren't sure, and the other ones didn't think they did. Um, also, 87% of them met their attorney in court. Only 42% met with their attorney actually at DCYC. Um, and only 47% even talked to their attorney on the phone. Having that co-location really does improve that efficiency. I also was a public defender. To make a, a client visit out there, I had to take the whole afternoon off, right? Because I needed to drive down there. The parking, as stated, is not desirable. Uh, and so it really would help and improve efficiency in our system. I also think the trauma-informed design is transformative. It goes along with the whole culture change. Um, when I go into DCYC currently in the mods, when we did the the surveys, they're 12 person mods, they can only house eight there now because of free of regulations. There's no windows in there, right? Keep talking about a campus setting, there aren't windows for them to see out, right? Um, you would have to totally level DCYC to make any significant changes there. And that's why I'm in full support of this proposal and the accompanying programming that's essential to have better outcomes for our children and families. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Vysick. Next up is Joy Souter. Good afternoon. Mary Vysick, I'm the Chief Probation Officer for the Juvenile Probation Office in Omaha. Um, much of what I was going to say has already been said, so I'll kind of cut to the chase and just articulate the fact that we have changed our services quite a bit. We have evolved to uh, reflect what is best practice for youth. Um, to clarify some of the other information that's been out there, we have opened the reception center through the Child Saving Institute, started using that. 
um, pro juvenile probation has also implemented a number of in-home services, which research shows is best practice to try and keep kids at home with their family. When we started those services, we started out with 16 families. We're now up to over 100. Um, the results are looking pretty good to be able to stabilize youth in their homes so they don't have to go out of the home and go to a higher level of treatment. Um, we have been working with all of the shelter and current juvenile justice agencies. Uh, Utah Holly has added six beds. We're working with the Omaha Home for Boys. Uh, who are also looking at adding eight beds. Um, that brings us up to a total of local over 50 shelter beds in our city. So we do have some other opportunities for children to receive good services. Um, proba juvenile probation continues to collaborate with all of the agencies as Dr. Foxall and Chief Warren alluded to uh, in regards to best practices for the juvenile detention alternatives, the crossover youth who find themselves in the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system. Um, working towards making every effort to support success of kids in their natural, natural communities, which is what the national research does reflect as the very best practice. Um, I'll stick around if there's questions later for anything else. Thanks. Thank you. Joy Souter. Next up, Wade Goring or Gehring. Thank you. My name is Joy Souter, S-U-D-E-R. Um, I'm representing Souter Law, P-C-L-L-O. I am, the address is 6035 Binney Street, suite number one. Um, I am a current juvenile court practitioner. I was a public defender in Douglas County for six years, and then for the last five years I've had my own practice, and I work in juvenile court, period. 98% uh, of my cases are court-appointed cases where I'm representing kids either as their defense attorney or as their guardian ad litem. The majority of my clients have spent at least one night in detention, which means that I spend a lot of time at the detention facility. And it's already been referenced that it's not easy to get out there. I want to talk to you about some of the current um, stressors as a practitioner of having the facility DCYC so far away. Um, one has indicated that it can be difficult to jump out there to see a client and then come back to court. A lot of that is because if I have a client who has a court hearing at 3.30 p.m., they've been transported over to the courthouse at 11.30 or 12. So then that client is now sitting in a lock, um, in the holding cell up at the top of the courthouse, or in the courthouse, I cannot have access to that client, I can't see them. They're sitting there for anywhere from one to four hours, sometimes more, waiting for their court hearing. Um, that is difficult. Uh, the second difficulty that I see as a practitioner and having done this for 11 years is that the youth center's location allows practitioners, it allows everyone who's involved in juvenile justice and serving the kids to adopt an out of sight, out of mind mentality. And I truly believe that. Uh, when I first started 11 years ago as an attorney working in, in juvenile court, I was told that the youth center gets used as a dumping ground. And I'm sorry to say that I haven't sh seen that shift so much. If we're talking about co-location, we're talking about a constant everyday reminder that these are the children that we are serving. I have two premises that I always live by and try to strive for, and one is that we shouldn't be causing any more harm to these children. And the second is that progress is never done. Every day we can do better. We should not, we don't conduct our offices the way that we did in the 1970s and the 1990s. We don't run for re-election on promises or premises that were appropriate in the 70s or in the 90s. We progress and we do better. Our children of our county deserve better. The families deserve better. Um, I appreciate your time, and I hope that you vote in support of this project, including the co-location. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Goring, you signed in. Did you have anything to say, or did you just happy to answer any questions? Uh, I have a few things to say. Okay. Because there was a note. But Welcome. Name and address. Wade Goering, 14141 O Street. Um, I do work for HDR. I will be here afterwards uh, to answer any questions you may have, but I'm also speaking as a private citizen. We have two experiences that my wife and I have uh, experienced. One was uh, when our nephew 
10 years ago was uh, removed from the home and we ended up becoming his legal guardian. Um, he had some, uh, he had a lot of truancy issues which caused him into getting into trouble. Ended up at DCYC uh, due to the broken home, had a lot of issues that we had to deal with at 13 uh, and uh, were able to get him graduated from school. If some of the programs that are being advanced today and talked about today had been available, uh, it would have been much easier for his life and our life, uh, incorporating him to, into our family and becoming a productive member of society. Another one is there's a close uh, friend of ours, family friend of ours, whose son was involved or got involved with drugs, had some mental health issues. If those issues had been, programs had been available to a, to address those needs, he wouldn't have ended up at DCYC and then out at Boys Town where he ran away and went to several other places before he ended up in Kearney. When he came back home, uh, there weren't programs to support the home, uh, re-entering him into the home life. And shortly thereafter, he ended back up at DCYC and a few other places and then ended back up at Kearney again. Uh, his experiences in being uh, taken from 42nd Street down to the courthouse uh, in shackles uh, with already a low self-esteem uh, reiterates a lot of the things and stories that have been told today. So uh, even though I'm in HDR, the reason I'm passionate about this project is because what my ex family has experienced. Thank you. Thank you. William Harris. Next up, Kathy Bigsby-Moore. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members. Uh, my name is William Harris. I live at 9205 Meadow Drive, Omaha, Nebraska. I'm an attorney in Nebraska in juvenile court. I've been practicing for 15 years. A uh, big issue I've seen in those 15 years is the difficulty at being able to provide juveniles with therapeutic services. Uh, Nebraska is still a rehabilitative state, not a punitive state. Um, it's my belief that the youth center is punitive, not rehabilitative. Uh, the current youth center is more of a punishment. Um, my clients over the years have referred to the youth center as a jail, not the youth center. Uh, I'm not aware of any services that can be offered at the youth center that could potentially help the juvenile to rehabilitate. And so I'm seeing uh, juveniles progress from the juvenile justice system up to the criminal system everything from rapes to, to murders. Um, also, it's my understanding this new facility, there would be better access to group homes, mental health services, foster care. Um, it's my belief that if we can reach these juveniles when they're young and put in therapeutic and rehabilitative services, that would uh, save us and the juveniles going forward. I believe that this new facility is more than just brick and mortar. Um, it's an opportunity to have the judges there, the prosecutors, the public defenders, the private attorneys, and all the people that can bring services to these children. With that, I hope you take this into consideration in making your decision. Thank you. Warren G. Taylor. Thank you. My name is Kathy Bigsby Moore. My address is 219 South 167th Street, and I'm here in strong support and urging you to support um, the bonds, including the co-located youth center facility. I've been doing juvenile justice work for a very long time. I first toured the Douglas County Youth Center in the 1980s and found the physical plant and programs greatly lacking. Sadly, I was very front and center during the 90s, during the um, expansion and renovation, and unfortunately, best practices even at that time were not followed. Uh, we saw a huge trajectory in the population of youth at the Douglas County Youth Center through the 90s and the early 2000s, and um, many of the best practices of those days were not possible to implement. I'm pleased to say, as you heard 
much of today, that in the last decade we have seen some substantial improvements in the availability of services. We've reduced the population by over 50 percent. And I believe that this is the opportunity you have before you today to continue the redirecting of our juvenile justice programming in Douglas County. I think this is an important opportunity that you have before you to speak loudly to the kids of our county and tell them how much we care for them and encourage their rehabilitation and give them hope that that is possible. Um, I'll just briefly make about four points. One is that the downtown location, as has been said, is much more appropriate for everyone involved, for the families, for the youth. The physical plant being proposed is much more appropriate and very in line with trauma-informed and best practice care. The co-location will also make it appropriate and easy for families to get to, for professionals to get to, and I'm hopeful that there will be the development of a resource center so that families can learn all of the opportunities that they have to reunite and rehabilitate their family. The proposed outdoor space, frankly, is much more campus-like than the facility that we have now, where I hear talk of a campus, but there is no campus atmosphere in that facility. I think the other point that has not been addressed is the juvenile justice and child welfare crossover, not only for a single youth, but for a family. Unfortunately, many of our families are involved both in the juvenile justice and child welfare system. This will give them an opportunity to really unify their family approach. If any of you are reading the um, series in the Omaha World Herald this week, I think we see that many of these youth come to us today from very difficult circumstances that we don't have control over. We can't control those circumstances, but we can control the future of our juvenile justice system. I urge you to do so today. Thank you. Thank you. Warren G. Taylor. Mr. Taylor. Antonio. Mr. Taylor, do you wish to speak? Okay. Antonio Moore. Mr. Moore. George Achola. Are there any other proponents who signed in whose name was not called? Are any other proponents wishing to be heard? This will be our last proponent. Good afternoon. Uh, as Mr. President has indicated, my name is George Achola. Uh, 10 Farland Street, and I come here as a proponent. I'm full disclosure. I am also an employee of Burlington Capital, so I can say that in this capacity I'm probably wearing two hats because I am a firm believer in this project, not only professionally but personally. And I understand that there are a few issues in our complex world that are literally black and white. You know, unlike the politi current political climate that we have in our country, it's very different from when this country started when the founders understood that in order to make a better union, you had to have some compromise. And I think that's what we've done to try to make this project work. I understand that when we first proposed 48 beds, you know, our juvenile justice expert indicated that if the county does what is appropriate for the county, the job is to reduce the amount of kids that are in detention. But some folks balked at that. Some of our opponents balked at that. Some of our friends in the police department balked at that. And I believe that we tried to compromise. We listened. And understanding that, you know, we are a community, we listened to them and we went from 48 beds to 64 beds. But we went beyond that. What we also did, understanding the perils of detention, as you've heard today, is we made arrangements with some of our providers to secure a mental health facility that hopefully will be done before this project is up and done. Up and done. That's going to be 18 to 20 beds. So you take the 64 and plus those beds, yeah, you're up to 82 to 84 beds. That's more than the average population of the center has been for the last five years. The other thing is, with the further commitments that have been made, working with Utah Holly, Child Saving Institute, Omaha Home for Boys, the capacity of the community is being built 
so that these kids are served in the community and not in detention where continued harm occurs, as you've heard. We're working with U-Turn and Mays, Metro Area Youth Service, to build the capacity to deal with some more of those high-risk youth. So those community services are continue to be built. I've always respected my friends at OPD. I have several friends, of personal friends, high school friends, college friends who don the shield. I don't let my disagreements with them become personal because I understand we're always going to have policy differences. That's what happens. But all the research indicates, and I've given you the attached document, that community-based services in detention is not is where the focus should be, not in detaining kids. I understand that they feel that we don't have enough beds, but there has to be alternatives rather than putting these kids in detention. Detention should be reserved for the most dangerous of the kids that we have to deal with. And I will tell you what has happened is the studies have shown in that document that I have shown, I hope that you all get the chance to read it, that when kids are detained, it's the door to going deeper into the system. And by by supporting this project, we're going to shut that door, hopefully, in this county and hopefully give our kids a chance to be productive citizens. And I hope I urge your support of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Our first opponent will be Commissioner Jim Cavanaugh. Next up is Anthony L. Connor. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Cavanaugh. I'm Douglas County Commissioner, um, and uh, I'm here to address you today in opposition to this uh, proposal. Um, a yes vote on this proposal uh, is a vote for a large unnecessary property tax increase. Um, this is a private construction project conflated to look like a juvenile reform program. A yes vote for this is a vote for a large unnecessary property and in tax increase to fund a private no-bid construction scheme. There's not a penny of spending in this for any programs for any kids. This is a construction project. Um, actually, it's bad for kids. 80% of our kids in detention now are minority children in an overwhelmingly majority community that's scandalous. And that percentage has been going up. Um, we have brought the number of children in detention down substantially in our current Douglas County Youth Center. Um, and that can go down still further. But that's all about programs. The program talk that you've heard today has been conflated with what is a large unnecessary property tax increase for a construction project. Um, the co-location argument that was originally trotted out by the proponents of this construction project has been vitiated, set aside, because now you're hearing about relocation to CSI, relocation to Utah Holly, relocation for the home for boys. And the alternative that you've all seen uh, that's been proposed does allow for co-location of courts and attorneys at the 42nd Street Douglas County Youth Center. The Chin Study, which you should be familiar with, says don't build a cell block downtown, build a campus like we have at 42nd Street. This is bad for the kids, bad for the taxpayers because you're going to use the highest interest rate that you can get, and you're going to have no vote of the people, and you're going to privatize the decision making, no public records, no public meetings. It's bad for downtown, you're going to kill the uh, Flatiron neighborhood if you do this, just like the neighborhood next to the Douglas County Correction Center was killed, except we'll have two jails instead of one. We'll have Jailers Canyon. Uh, this is 114, 120 plus million dollars for building and zero for programs. Um, what we've got isn't perfect, but it works. Bricks and mortar will not fix what we've got. Programs will. This is not the city's responsibility. 23,000 square feet total in this project, 220 for an Omaha Police Department assembly area. Less than one tenth of one percent for anything to do with the city of Omaha. Do not vote for this property tax increase. There's a better way to go. You've been presented with an alternative. It exists. There are lots of problems. We can fix them for less, and we can allow the people to vote on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Connor. Mm -hmm. 
Anthony Connor, 13445 Cryer Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska. Good afternoon, council members and city citizens of Omaha. As you know, I am the president of the Omaha Police Officers Association, and I was elected to represent officers, sergeants, lieutenants, and captains working in the city of Omaha. I am here in opposition to this project, but our opposition is limited to the bed space at the proposed new juvenile detention center. This issue deals directly with our working conditions. Officer safety and public safety are our focus. We have highlighted on our social media platforms, and I've spoken to most of you council members, about the experience our officers have had when dealing with juvenile offenders, especially those that commit the most heinous crimes, including carjackings, robberies, and drive-by shootings. I'm referring to the violent incidents that have happened in mid-May and early June of this year. We believe there has been an undue, quiet, yet strong pressure put on the juvenile system to release violent offenders even before having a detention hearing to find safe placement. We believe this is being done to artificially deflate the numbers and thus help justify the proposed number of 64 beds. I have worked in this city as a police officer for almost 19 years, all but the last year I've worked in patrol and the majority of time in the community that I am from, North Omaha. As a patrol officer, I have received the radio calls where mothers are fed up, throwing up their hands, and um, dealing with their juveniles that are out of control. They call 911 hoping for help. I'm, I am referring to the minor offenses when detention is not an option, such as simple assaults, destruction of property, shoplifting, and running away. Police officers defuse situations and relieve those stressed out parents. We don't try to detain these kids based on truly low level matters. We are, talking about, we are not talking about these kids. We as a community have always needed enhanced programming to help these families long before the juvenile commits a violent felony. We have needed this long before this detention center has even been discussed. Reducing detention by limiting the ability to detain appears to be the goal. We think that's risky. Commissioner Rogers has said publicly, if you build 100 beds, you will lock up 100 kids. We believe this is a flawed way to approach this very serious issue. If we need 100 beds or even 150 beds to keep challenged youth safe, the public safe, and to provide them with enhanced re rehabilitation, then that's a good thing and that's what we need. We know firsthand we need the needs in this community as we are the ones that are in the homes all across the city. Just as Councilman Pauls explained last week when discussing the low bid trash service in his, in his visit, and he visited those cities and the towns that they serve, he explained the importance of talking to the workers at the ground level to get a clear understanding of the issue. On this issue, we are the boots on the ground and our perspective should be included in these discussions and considered. We are the subject matter experts. You are the policy makers. Ultimately, the vote is yours. But we, want you to be able, we want you to be able to cast your vote with eyes wide open to the possible consequences. I know my time is running low, so we implore you to vote no on this project. And to add one thing to Mr. George Chola's comments, I have always been an open, um, available person to speak to. Um, I've given him my card. I've given Mr. Rogers my card. I'm available, I'm open, I'll talk to anybody. Um, I've not received a call until this week when we started doing our social media posts. Then all of a sudden I started getting phone calls. I think that's disingenuous to say that we've been at the table and discussed these things because it hasn't happened, not with me. And I've been nothing but open to every one of you guys and also um, any citizen in the city. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. I'll, I'll hang around for questions. Thank you. Right. Bob Perrin is next, followed by Luis Jimenez with Michael O'Hara on deck. Um, uh, Bob Heron, 1101 South 36th Street. I really have to oppose this project, mostly because of the way that it's been done and the way it's been started. Um, it was almost secret had it not been for one building that stopped them and brought it into public eye. When they started eminent domain, then the world found out about it, and the next thing you know, things were being done without any input from anybody. So that's really alarming. But we, do, we did find out there was a Chin study, and that Chin study had three main points to it. The first one is that we should have programs to take care of our youth. The next one is that we should co-locate co them with our um, legal services, and that it should not be in an urban environment, but should be in a campus-like setting. And so what we've done is said, well, we'll take two of these. We're going to get some programs. But by the way, those came after the building project. They didn't come before. That was a secondary thought when it was exposed to the public. Co-location, we dove right into that. We're going to build a courthouse annex. We're going to put the kids next door. But we're going to scrap the urban thing, and that's where we're going to put them in a high-rise tower. 
we have the resources in our community. This is New York City. It isn't a large Chicago suburb. We have the resources to build a campus-like setting for our youth if we really want to take care of the youth. That's the direction that we should be going. We should not be putting them downtown. And the real direction for the youth would be to put the courts near where the campus setting is for the kids. It's not to say we have to keep the courts here and bring the kids to it. Let's put the kids in the right place and, took, and take the courts and the lawyers to them. So we can say that this facility that we're building is newer and better, right? It has better colors, softer materials, but each facility, each bed is still a cell for each one of these kids. It's still a cell. And when I hear this thing, oh, it's better for the kids, they don't have the ability to see outside, but we have a courtyard, a beautiful courtyard, not for the kids, for the public. The kids can't even see the courtyard. That's, that's, um, that's absurd. That just makes me, makes me sick, quite frankly. So I think this program has been gone, started too fast. It's a building project. It's not a, it's being um, morphed into something for the kids, but it's really a building project. And we have the responsibility to sit back and look at what we really need. Let's get our program strong, and then let's continue to develop the buildings that we need for those programs. Thank you. Mr. Jimenez, followed by Mr. O'Hara. I'm sorry, Mr. Durham. Can Ms. Uh, O'Hara go first before me? I'm having some technical difficulties. Sure. Mr. O'Hara, and then followed by Mr. Jimenez. Hello, I'm Michael O'Hara. I live at 6010 South 146th Street. Co-location. It's a buzzword you've heard used correctly and incorrectly multiple times today. As noted, if you're not at the same location, you are not co-located. I want to speak about another type of co-location that's being used incorrectly. That is adding a false statement to multiple true statements in order to make the false statement look true. It is true we need to remodel Douglas County Youth Center. It is true we need more programs at Douglas County Youth Center. It is true that we need space for the judges. It is true that we need space for the attorneys. It is false that you need to vote yes for this program to do any of that. I want to speak to three issues, policy, legality, and politics. Policy. I've never met an elected official who was unwilling to raise taxes when appropriate. I've never met two elected officials that agreed when it was appropriate. <laughs> they have different criteria. Part of what's appropriate in the public policy of the state of Nebraska is you do a vote of the people when you're going to build something. The reason we do that is so that the people can control the expenses. As soon as you build the building, you fill it with staff. That is the tax increase you're supposed to vote on. The building is supposed to be voted on by the people. Another policy issue, we have a special bonding authority to build buildings like this, where you're going to merge tax bases, county and city. This is a county project. The youth center is county, the courts are county, the attorneys are county. The city ought not be doing this. Legality. I won't answer any legal questions. I will ask you to ask your attorneys for answers. And I would include in that your bond council, because the bond council for the 501c3, the bond council for the county, the bond council for the building commission is the same firm. Yours is different. Is this joint use? How much do you have to have that's the same to be joint? Are these revenue bonds, or are they really general obligation bonds? When you have diversions as promoted, promoted for these programs without court order, are they lawful? And what happens when you lose? In terms of politics, raising taxes is always the toughest one. Doing revenue bonds makes it look like you're not. However, who is the only source of revenue for these revenue bonds? The county. And the county is going to raise the taxes, and you're going to vote to raise those taxes. Basically, you're going to provide political cover for your colleagues on the county board. Most importantly, this reminds me of the music man, Flim Flam. You are being asked to participate in the Flim Flam of the people by denying them their role in this process. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. 
Thank you. Mr. Jimenez, you're up, followed by Patrick McDermott. I had my comments prepared, but the computer just went out. So I, I'm a, an opponent. Um, Name and address. Uh, Luis Jimenez, 518 North 40th Street. If I remember my points, um, the Juveniles and the youth in the community need space for their adolescence, adolescence. We as adults, we can provide that for our wellness because we have expendable I income on occasion. So we can go out into town, we can go to the capital district, we can go to Oxarban, we can go to a movie. Uh, so it, if we as a community w want, to have a, want to avoid miscreants among us, Let's provide space for their adolescence. The thing that has bothered me through this whole process is that James Kavanaugh, Commissioner James Kavanaugh, has provided an alternative. And Commissioner Kraft, at every turn, belittled his efforts in saying it's political. <laughs> it was politically driven and he looked good dissenting. Uh, well, the election is over, and the people are still asking for an alternative to the plan that uh, HDR has, which is basically the adult, de uh, adult detention center uh, where you have little space for judges, a lot of space for offenders. Their, their plan has a lot of space for judges and legal services and little space for the juvenile offenders. Um, so it's basically uh, different polarities with the same design. Here is an alternative, please, that I put together, th that I've put together based on the, what I've seen. And if here is um, the courthouse. Here is the new space right here out, out on the platform, uh, catwalk uh, or skywalk, um, two buildings that are vacated that could house legal services. Here's the, H, uh, the MUD building and uh, here is a courthouse, courthouse annex connected um, as a connector. You know, Preserve, this will preserve the historical character of the area. And uh, Mr. Durham, unfortunately, we didn't have time to discuss what your people, people first campaign meant to me. And to me, it is putting people over institutions in arrangements. So I kind of feel like you're my vote on this. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. McDermott, followed by Dr. Constance Meyerndorf. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick McDermott. I reside at 1822 North 95th Plaza. I'm a constituent of Mr. Festerson. Uh, I'm also a retired county court judge from the 5th Judicial District of the state of Nebraska. Uh, for 20 years I served on the bench. I was a juvenile judge with, or a county judge with juvenile jurisdiction. Uh, and most of what I prepared the proponents went over. I'm a big believer in community-based programming. I am a big believer in not locking kids up because that's what the studies say reduce recidivism. I prepared remarks. I'll turn them over. You can look at those. I did list out for you those portions of best practices that I actually used on every detention decision. Most often, my decision was not, do I detain? It's, do I release? They're already detained. Sometimes that used to get the ire of the judge up a little bit. 
because detaining somebody for shoplifting is nonsense. Crimes against property, it's nonsense. You detain people who have committed a dangerous offense. And one, there are two things in this whole project that are really, really troubling. A, bond money does not buy a single program. It builds a building. So all of these wonderful programs that we have heard about, where's that money coming from? It's not coming from the bond issue. You're going to have to come up with it, or the county board's going to have to come up with it, or the NGOs are going to have. So don't be dissuaded into this is a kumbaya moment for everyone. And the last thing I would say to you is this. First lesson you learn as a judge. Don't decide something that you don't have to decide. All of you who are lawyers have read in appellate decisions, having determined the case, we need not address the party's other statements of error. This is a county issue. Why would you folks spend your political capital imposing a tax that you will be held accounted for to meet an obligation that solely belongs to Douglas County. That's, see, it's now I'm off the bench. I can make political comments. It's one of my great joys. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't register as per curiam. No, sure? I did not. <laughs> I am speaking only for myself. I've done this for 45 years. I was a member of the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges am still a member, was on their board of directors for five years. This is not new material to me. Well, thanks for I coming. I thank you for your attention. Dr. Meyerendorf, followed by Senator Ernie Chambers. I'm glad I don't have to follow Ernie Chambers. <laughs> Constance Meyerendorf, 5611 Emily Street, Omaha. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I, I'm here with a lot of volunteers who have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours over the past year and a half on this issue. We are all for the kids. There's not a single person here who doesn't want to see that the kids are treated fairly, that they get the very best services possible. We've heard a lot from the proponents about the ideas of uh, change and what we seem to be confusing, I think, is the idea that building a box, a four-story box, downtown Omaha, is somehow going to help rehabilitate children better than remodeling, and we know that it's not perfect on 42nd and Woolworth Street, remodeling an existing uh, building. We've been out there with architects, very professional people who have told us it has good bones. What we need to do is remodel, give them the spaces that they need, and give them something that is campus-like, not um, a cell block in downtown Omaha. Something that looks more like the junior high campus than um, a cell block in, um, in our backyards here. So the, the proponents uh, of the system are, are confusing change with buildings. We want to invest in the programs for the kids, and some of those programs are working. We know that we have reduced our population at the youth center 56 percent since 2008, and we can continue to do that. Why wouldn't we want to remodel on three acres of land surrounded by trees and grass as opposed to a 0.3 acre uh, cell block downtown? The Chin study, which you've heard of, and I'm sure you've all read several times, um, is um, often referred to. It was commissioned by the Public Building Commission for $189,933. Uh, among the things that Chin um, recommends uh, is co-location. She says co-location is the best thing since sliced bread on 15 to 20 two acres. I don't think we have 15 to 22 acres out here. Low rise, extended like a campus is what she's seeking. Our alternative does provide for courtrooms, at least two, 
on the 42nd Street location. And there is a courtroom, as you know, in the Justice Center downtown. I wanted to cite, um, not, she cites nine reasons why we shouldn't put a youth jail. This is on page 93. Nine reasons why we shouldn't put a youth jail downtown. Uh, I won't read all of them, but she says, a, recent, a review of recently completed juvenile detention facilities nationwide suggests that low rise, low rise, or at grade solutions are preferred in order to maximize views to the outdoors, natural, natural light, connection to nature, and access to outdoor recreation. Can we get you to wrap up? Okay. Transportation is an issue for everyone in this city, but people get to the Douglas County Health Center, they get to the Veterans Hospital, and they can continue to get to the 42nd Street facility. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Chambers, welcome to the Omaha City Council. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. I hope you can hear me. I'm here primarily to appear and show that I'm opposed to what's being done. I cannot change anybody's mind. If you're for the project, you would remain for it. If you're opposed to it, you will be opposed to it. The practical aspects have been touched on by those who pointed out that the city council is being asked to bail out the county. I don't like the process that took place. I believe in transparency. I believe in accountability, which goes to those who are making decisions being held accountable. But when private, wealthy, powerful men make the decision, they're accountable to nobody but can call politicians to account. I believe in public participation, and rather than have an opportunity like this, where you're given three minutes, which I don't condemn because of the nature of what we're doing, there should be opportunities while the project is being developed to allow the public to participate, not just sit and listen, but to give their input. Who can give anything of significant substance in three minutes, not even I. <laughs> so what I want to point out is that the building commission and the way they handle this project has given impetus to what I believe in, which is the necessity of having a vote by the public when there is to be a large bond issue. This project has given impetus to what I intend to do next session of the legislature. There will be some reconfiguring of the state statutes that deal with the building commission. I'm very disappointed in the way Senator Boyle, excuse me, Commissioner Boyle changed positions. He's entitled to do that. He's not accountable to me, but I misjudged him and was disappointed. I hope that this council will not be put in a position of looking like the water carrier, the hand persons, they usually say handmaiden, of wealthy interests. One of those interests persuaded a senator to bring a bill to rename, redefine as tangible personal property, real property. I raised the issue on the floor of the legislature. They passed the bill. I suggested that the governor get an attorney general's opinion. The governor did that. The attorney general gave the opinion. The governor vetoed the bill on the basis that I offered. I believe in following the rules. I want no special consideration. And this last, it's outside my presentation, I have not been dealt with in a way that's disrespectful. I requested to not be the first one to speak, and that request was granted, and I thank the one who did it. That's all that I have. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Larry Stoor is next, followed by Maria Fernandez. Thank you. Larry Stoor, 5015 Lafayette Avenue. 
Omaha, Nebraska. I'm ashamed for a number of reasons, but I'm ashamed for our city, our county board, our city council, our, our county, our state. Because I think if you look at this very simply, what we're hearing here is the admission of a lot of failure. Failure to meet the need of those kids at the school level, at the parent level, before they get adjudicated. And excuse me, use the words that are necessary to use. Don't be afraid to say arrested. Don't be afraid to say jailed. It's not going to hurt anybody's bubble. Let's, let, let's talk real life with these kids. Maybe they'll learn something. Um, words matter. You can dress them up with whatever you want, call it a different word. You can do the public relations in the Omaha World Herald and in the Reader Magazine, but detaining is still detaining. Arresting is still detaining. Whether it's a box, a four-story building, or a glorious campus, you're still detaining that child, are you not? CSI for a couple hours, that's detention. Six weeks, that's detention. Call it detention. But don't say to the people of Omaha and to the youth out there that, oh, gosh, I hate to say this, but maybe you could go commit a crime and we'll get you some help because we'll detain you down at the juvie center. Oh, don't use the word juvie. It might hurt his feelings, her feelings. What do you do, though, with the kids when they turn 18 years in one day, 19 years in one day? 20 years in one day? Where's the cutoff? When are you going to stop discriminating against the others? All the best practices people here will tell you they don't mature until they're 26. Their brain is a juvenile or a child until they're 26. But our best practices to date have not worked, have they? Because now we need a whole new building. The numbers aren't really down. It's just that we're re releasing them early. We're not really detaining them. So stop blowing smoke in our ears. And be honest with these kids. And ask the people that provide these services why their mission statements are not performing. You have a mission statement. They have a mission statement. Why do we have so many problems? I'll tell you what. I have a grandson that didn't get into the juvenile justice system, but he was in the welfare system, just turned 20, and he's not getting the help he needs. He finally is in the justice system now, on my birthday, my 76th birthday. But for eight years or more, people in this county, in this city, and in Lancaster County were not giving him the help that he needed. And that was to understand that when you do wrong, there is a consequence. Somehow people don't learn that. Needs to wrap Thank up. you. Thank you. Maria Fernandez, followed by Blake Rave. Maria Fernandez, 1101 Jackson Street, uh, Omaha. Um, everyone has spoken strictly on the issue of juvenile justice. I'd like to expand this to the issue of juvenile justice as a component in a city. Um, a city is made up of several elements, and they all influence each other. They all feed off of each other. They all grow off of each other. Or they all destroy each other. We'd like to be the one that feeds, grows, and develops. The proponents today have spoken very eloquently of all the positive outcomes of what is already in place, and not a single one of them referred to a building. It referred to programs. It referred to, um, it referred to all the institutions in this town that are already serving 
our youth. So my question is, then why are we putting $34 million in a building? If we focused on, uh, a gentleman pointed out to um, the crime and the, uh, the conditions in North Omaha and how the 75 North program has, uh, has brought growth to the area. Well, poverty and crime seem to go hand in hand. Why don't we focus on eliminating those instead of a building that is, was not used as an indicator of improving the situation for youth? Um, what is a city? A city and what is a downtown specifically because this detention center intends to be placed downtown. They're places of commerce, entertainment, tourism, work, stay and play. This ensures its vibrancy long past the nine to five work day. Downtowns are where a city showcases what it celebrates and wants to show off. To that end, we build what enhances, not depresses. After years of struggling to find our soul, <clears throat> we finally have in the little neighborhood gems, the, the old faithful old market, followed by Dundee, Benson, Midtown Crossing, and Blackstone. We have a thriving Hispanic enclave in South Omaha and a cozy district in driving Little Italy. 13th Street is coming alive as is 10th Street three blocks away to the east. After decades of languishing as a wasteland in the wake of street closings, North Omaha and Northeast Downtown is experiencing a long overdue res resurrection. All these areas are alive from dawn to way past dusk. The Flat Iron District is plunked right in the middle of a continuum that stretches from the old market and soon down to the river to 72nd Street. I need you to wrap up, Maria. It could develop into an amazing neighborhood, neighborhood save for the threat of, an, of another detention center just two blocks from an adult jail. What did that neighborhood, uh, what that neighborhood, what it did to that neighborhood needs no highlighting. And I beg to defer with Mr. Kraft when he says Leavenworth is a thriving district. Well, if that's what we consider progress, we are dead before arrival, not on. Thank you. Um, well, I do have this written up, so I'd like we'll, to pass it on to you. Thank you. We'll, we'll make it part of the record. Mr. Rave, followed by Nicole LeClerc. Blake Rave. Don't see Mr. Rave, so Nicole. LeClerc, followed by Norma LeClerc. Hello, my name is Nicole LeClerc. I live in Sarpy County, 1802 Brenda Drive, Bellevue, Nebraska, but have spent most of my life in and around downtown Omaha, only about a 10 minute drive away. In fact, I've always loved and been quite proud of Omaha and often brag about it to anyone who will listen. This last year, I've attended numerous meetings, both public here in this building and community throughout Omaha. On this subject, however, has changed this for me. Initially, my attendance was to help save a historical building from imminent domain and possible destruction, but then I continued to learn about juvenile justice and the rest of the story. This year has been my first exposure to civic duty. I've received an education that I never wanted. When I've told friends what I was doing, I observed, maybe even heard their eyeballs rolling in their heads. They then questioned me, why? The why meant, why bother? It's already a done deal. With the assumption that officials are bought and sold and not interested in their constituents and what the people think and want to say. Sadly, I've watched a lot of this occur. When citizens have spoken with consideration, thoughtfulness, and nervousness without getting paid to be here, I've watched officials who are paid and paid by the very people addressing them, no less, rub their hands loudly, crumple up paper, whisper and speak amongst themselves, answer cell phones, look away, down, anywhere, do anything to avoid the person speaking. I've watched these officials do the same to each other. None of us can believe the behavior we have seen. 
We've been, even been called noise, and most recently this morning, nonsense. Well, this noise and this nonsense have given them more time to refine their plans and programs, and even with that, they are still not clear. When HDR speaks of their plan for the Downtown Justice Center with the attached Juvenile Justice Center, they often mention civic pride. There is nothing about this plan that shows civic pride. If anything, there is a certain shame built into this plan, the future walls of its buildings. Shame for not truly considering the health of these kids as not even something so basic as windows were shown in the original plans, and now it is only something called borrowed light. Shame for not truly involving the communities and families of these children and what they might need more than another jail for their children. Community forums that are not well advertised, if at all, do not count. And what they need, what I've heard, is not to be studied and researched more and diagnosed more. They are sick and tired of this. It is to be supported and seen just like everyone here today. What they want is better wages and safe places for their kids to be just kids. So many of these no longer exist. Without this or that program or agenda being shoved down their throat by people who think they know what is best for them. Shame for, for not having all of this out in the open from the beginning for everyone to easily understand and make a decision confidently. I know I'm running out of time. So, um, I will just ask, for whom is this plan reformed? The kids or the cities and counties with the expense of housing these kids? For the convenience of the judges and attorneys, let's keep Omaha's kids where they are at 42nd Street. Let's move some judges and attorneys up there. Let's redo the building with green space where there's actually room for it and won't just be a patch of grass on a roof. Why not work with the people on this instead of against them? There are hundreds who cannot be here behind each of us standing up in opposition today. We can do this together we can do together, what we can do today, together is so much stronger than what we can do apart. Please vote no on this next week. Have confidence in Omaha and its people and let them vote. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Norma, your turn. Name and address. Sharon Martin, you're up next. Norma oh. LeClaire, 1802 Brenda Drive, Bellevue, Nebraska. I don't think I can add another thing. These people have all spoken so eloquently. But I have to say what I hear over and over again is that people want a right to vote when it's their money that's involved. I've attended many meetings, three or four a week, which you've heard over and over from all these folks. We paid for our own parking. We were not on any payroll and we came because we really cared about the kids, and the opposition really cares about the kids too. But I have to say, with all of the meetings, there are as many questions now as there were a year ago, and most of them remain unanswered. The most important part is the expense of $39 million to build a shiny new building before one child is helped. <clears throat> I heard Commissioner Morgan speak at the meeting this morning, and he actually said that the adult jail built 30 years ago on Leavenworth has not hurt downtown, and this new juvenile detention center won't either. We had a president arrive a couple of hours ago. I wonder what route they took but I don't think it was 16th and Leavenworth. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Martin, followed by Greg Sexer. My name is Sharon Martin, and I live at 1101 Jackson Street in the Old Market. Uh, I've been an educator for nearly 50 years, <laughs> and um, I've been involved with this process because I really do advocate for kids. But I'm opposed to this plan for a variety of reasons. A year and a half ago, I attended with some fellow people who were concerned and interested in an open meeting that would discuss what were the plans for really making our juvenile system what we want and need it to be. And I went to this meeting, and it was disappointing because we had some questions. Well, who made the decision? How was the decision made? 
who was engaged with the process. We did not get answers about that. This decision, we were told, was made by a commission of eight people based on a study that was paid for. But as I read it, because we were given a copy of the Chin Report, that study didn't really support what they were suggesting we support. So I want to spend my time addressing a few things that are truisms, and they're in the report that we were given a year and a half ago. First of all, there were eight points that were commissioned to be studied. And there was a needs assessment, uh, developed space requirements, and they were to analyze options for master plans. Well, eight points were all related to study of the current court system. The study was done well, five-month study, and it clearly aligned improving our court services and voting yes on new court annex. There is a statement that I want to tell you that added a ninth point. And this is by the author of the Chen study. An assessment of secure detention requirements was not included in the original request for proposal. Following throughout the document are statements and disclaimers for what she suggests because there isn't evidence for that piece of this plan. And that's what I'd like to speak to and tell you why I had fear, uncertainty, and doubt that the points, oh boy, that was a fast three minutes. <laughs> so I, I hope that I can have time to, uh, to point out a few things. And just so everyone knows, we have the Chin report. So if you okay. choose to tell us what's in it, we. But I, no, it isn't that. It is to emphasize that there was no overall vision and mission statement, and we've heard how important that is. There was no ongoing systematic dialogue with coordinating councils to review the systems. And that's happening, and we can hear that, and we fully agree that those things need to be done. The data collection was not there to make any accurate guide to decision making. Data is important. Data-driven solutions are important. I'm gonna there need was you to, not to wrap data. Up. She also suggested two plans that she says these are proposed plans that are just thrown out there because I was asked to have two plans, and that was a big plan for a large-scale operation, like Kavanaugh has discussed, presented, and had rejected, not even looked at. The other was one that is a small scale one that had lots of cons and that's the one that you're voting on lots of cons that should raise red flags about the risks involved with a yes vote it is not ready for prime time thank, thank you. you greg sexer followed by kathleen jamrosi Uh, Greg Sexer, President R Omaha 712 South 16th Street. Um, make no mistake, um, the building of the Douglas County Correctional Facility gutted that neighborhood. The adding to it and remodeling of it in the late 1990s further gutted it. If this is allowed to happen, um, it's going to gut the Flatiron District and everything else that's around it. After it happens, you'll see it after it happens. So I respectfully um, ask the members of the City Council next week to please vote these requests for bonds down. Thank you very much. Can we have your address? For oh, yeah, 712 South 16th Street. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Jamrosi, followed by Ed Walsh. Good afternoon. I'm going to get to my last comment first because I don't, I did not time myself and I forgot my glasses. Um, I think no matter how you, thanks, but no matter how 
people end up voting. This conversation has been good for the youth of our city that will be served. Um, I am so impressed with a lot of the folks that got up in support of this proposal. I am absolutely opposed, having sat in many, many meetings. I have, oh, 1614 South 93rd Avenue, but I've been paying taxes by running my restaurant at 17th and Howard. I will be looking at the new jail block. That is what the flat iron. Now, I'm going to paint a quick picture. Every day in nice weather, people show up with cameras outside of the Flatiron building. They're brides and grooms, and I take pictures of the people taking pictures, and I just love that scene. And so does Omaha. Omaha love. They almost knocked that building down three times. When I came back to Omaha, I got docent training down at the Durham Museum, and I looked at images of buildings that were gone, that brought tears to my eyes. This is what we've gotten rid of. So while no one disagrees that we need courtroom space, it did have very much a feeling of like this railroading type of, I've sat in the board meetings, I've been to community meetings, I've listened to people that are youth advocates. I'm not entirely self-serving here by saying I'm trying to save my neighborhood and in and with all due respect to Commissioner Kraft, Royce Maynard has bought up a lot of buildings. They have spent a fortune developing a plan for a Flatiron District, which he said to a large group of us, and in I think, I don't know that he mentioned it in his first article in the paper, but he said that those plans would definitely, I mean, they were going to come screeching to a halt. That is a a tax-paying base neighborhood that they bought up buildings and they've got a beautiful Flatiron District logo design that he said they, they would definitely uh, have to step back from their vision. So I would ask everybody to consider their favorite neighborhood because I think we all believe that we want to do what's best for the youth of our city. And co-location when I first heard it I thought this is the greatest thing ever but then I sat in meetings and I and I heard about the chin report and I you know I don't believe I think that it is we're putting up a false equivalency and that did go really fast um, I'm just asking that you vote no save a neighborhood put the money in the kids we got a spot already, 42nd and we'll work. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Walsh, filed by, followed by Carol Zasik. Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Dr. Ed Walsh, and I live at 301 South 54th Street. Um, and I have uh, um, was the director of the Auditory Physiology Lab, uh, de Developmental Auditory Physiology Lab at the Boys Town National Research Hospital for about, about almost 30 years until the end of last year. And uh, I've been a, a member of the neuroscience community for my entire professional life. And as a consequence of my research background, my research interests and uh, academic interest in general, I've been an, uh, an advocate a student of the development of the brain, of the mammalian brain, of the human brain. And um, I'm here mainly to tell you guys that the, that, 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 that the picture of how the brain develops over the course of the past 50 years has been revised radically. Uh, that uh, the old uh, nature versus nurture argument that uh, prevailed for most of uh, the preceding century, uh, one that basically says that the genetic influences over the development of the brain and the nurturing or environmental influences that affect the development of the brain are, in, are, are, are independent has been replaced by a far more informed and accurate model uh, that was largely the consequence of a study uh, the, uh, you know, of a branch of biology called epigenetics, which I would love to give you a lecture on, but I don't think that clock is going <laughs> to provide that kind of a resource, time resource. Uh, but in this new version, we do understand now with clarity 
that, that there is a, d a dependency, that the, that the uh, genetic influence, that our genes influence uh, the, uh, the uh, environment, and the opposite is true as well. And the bottom line being here, that, that these, there is a serious interplay between uh, genes and environmental experience. And the most significant thing I would like to say for, to you today is that this, the biology tells us, the neuroscience tells us, that the experiences that we have during the developmental period, which is the very period when the youth that we're serving in the detention center are going through, our, the, through the system, that the, 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 those influences literally affect, influence our DNA. And I'd like to just take just a minute to let that sort of settle in. I mean, that is remarkable. Our experience, who we interact with, where we live, everything that we do in life during that developmental period is influencing our DNA. That's a fairly remarkable observation to make. And in the context of what we're here to talk about today, Brooks and Mortar, and Mortar do matter because they create the environment in which the youth that we're serve the youths that we're serving are experiencing their uh, time with us in uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the juvenile system. So, so we have an enormously important decision to make here. But I would argue that it is a no-brainer from a scientific point of view that the that that a campus a welcoming campus-like system uh, at Forty Second and Woolworth is so far superior to anything that's being proposed. Alternatively, I would urge you, from the depth of my conscience, from the depths of my personality, deny the, the request for bond support to build a juvenile center in downtown Omaha. Let's give our, gene, let's give our kids the opportunity to let their genes work for them in a positive way. Thank Thanks. you, Dr. Welsh. And before uh, Carol Zasek speaks, um, if you are an opponent and wish to speak and haven't yet filled out the form requesting the time, please, there's still time to register. But Carol, you're up, followed by Joanne McGee. Okay, thank you all so much for letting me speak. My name is Carol Zaychek, actually. Uh, Rhymes with paycheck. Um, I, I live at 2518 North 64th Street lived in Omaha all of my life and when I started getting involved in this about a little right around a year ago I stated then and I still state now this should be a vote of the people not some sort of crazy tied together bond issue I also at that very time and still say it now I would be happy to be a volunteer to come up with decent alternatives there have not been any additional alternatives it's been literally a done deal everybody's had their mind made up that this is going to be this co-located building downtown well perhaps we should consider co-location at 42nd street because of the fact that for me i work downtown at the orpheum i work at the century link oh excuse me at the chi center i work down here i don't want to see a jail co-located next to another jail close to the bus terminal. You know, it's easy to, if, let's say for example, what if a kid does escape, they can hide downtown, they can easily get away. But if they're further away from downtown, then there's a little bit less of a possibility of anything else happening or even escape. But that's neither here nor there, because again, also I am a taxpayer and my taxes, that consistently actually were relatively okay from when I bought my house in 1999 in Benson to now. They'd been going up, you know, just a relative okay amount. When I got my taxes this year, 115000 went up to, for a v property valuation up to 160000 of a 40% increase. Ground hasn't even been broken on this yet, and I'm going to be footing that bill. And I don't want to be footing that bill. And I don't see any reason to do that when, again, vote of the people should be the first and foremost thing on all of your minds. We should be allowed to have input on what is going to be affecting our livelihoods and our residences. That, as well as the fact that this is not best practices for the children. And I also <laughs> had been speaking with a... Um, a person who actually worked out at the detention center and said a lot of these kids really are hard cases 
and they really would need shackles even if they're walking across the skywalk. So you're still not going to get rid of shackles no matter what you're doing. If kids are bad, kids are bad. You really need to start off with programs, not the brick and mortar. Programs are what are needed, and that's my input. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne McGee, followed by Dan Martin. Good afternoon. I'm Joanne McGee, and I reside in Omaha at 301 South 54th Street. I'm a neuroscientist and a very concerned citizen with regard to this issue. Let me first begin by thanking all of you as representatives of the citizens of Omaha for all that you do for Omaha and its citizens. Um, the decision concerning the location of the juvenile detention center is a critical one, as you well know and one that will have an impact on the future of Omaha and the youth of, of for years to come. I'm a firm believer that our policymakers need to base their decisions on best practices that have been validated by the scientific process, that have been peer reviewed by um, experts in the area based on evidence um, associated with those topics. And after reviewing the proposals that have been put forth by to create an urban detention center for the youth and um, plans to renovate the 42nd Street facility. It's clear based on the scientific evidence that renovating the facility on the 42nd Street um, could create a more campus-like setting as has been described previously. Like Boys Town, like the Omaha Home for Boys, like the Utah Haley Academy, these all have campus-like settings and that's for good reason. Um, research has shown that um, facilities that are placed in non-urban settings are superior to downtown facilities, which clearly have a far more prison-like atmosphere. The young people who get into trouble clearly have, for the most part, already led traumatized lives, and we need to find ways to reduce their trauma while they're in our care. Um, and research has clearly shown that environment does play a very important role. Scientists have found strong evidence between exposure to natural environments um, and recovery from physiological and psychological stress. A patch of grass on the roof as proposed for the downtown facility is not equivalent to a true outdoor facility as you all know. Um, and clearly we can place uh, uh, a, a more urban-like, a more um, um, campus-like setting at the location on 42nd that we can't do in a downtown location. Carefully designed studies have shown that more natural environments compared to urban environments elicit more positive feelings. They diminish fear and anxiety in individuals who are stressed, and they reduce anger and aggressive behavior, which is the starting point. That's where we ha need to start with the kids before we can even suggest community-based services will be helpful. So taking advantage of the current housing location that can be renovated to a more like campus setting um, rather than housing the youth in a downtown urban setting, I think is a scientifically informed practice that can aid in promoting the well-being of the youth and so that they can reach their full potential. So I urge you to vote no for placing our, our the juvenile detention center in a downtown location. Thank you. Uh, Dan Martin followed by Kelsey Johnson and if there's any other opponents after Chris Chapelier, uh, raise your hand if you wish to speak and have not signed <coughs> in so can we get this gentleman the form please thank you Dan good afternoon my name is Dan Martin my address is 13445 Cryer Avenue I am on the executive board for the Omaha Police Officers Association and I'm also a supervisor in the Omaha Police Gang Unit. Uh, first off, I'd like to say I think I agree with 99% of the supporters and what they're proposing. Um, programs, rehabilitation, that's, I think we're all on the same page and we all agree that the kids come first and, that, and that's foremost what we need to talk about. I am in opposition to this project mainly because of the bed space and the release of very violent juvenile offenders that I deal with firsthand daily at my job. 
As a sergeant in the gang unit, I see firsthand the need for juvenile justice reform. I value our strong partnership with probation and other programs that we take an active role and programs aimed at keeping kids out of trouble. Community-based policing and, pre and prevention are primary focuses of the gang unit. We want to intervene in the lives of these kids before tragedy strikes. I think we can all agree that real rehabilitative efforts must be at the forefront of this discussion, but also applying those rehabilitative efforts responsibly to protect our citizens is our duty. I'd like to highlight some of the recent cases that we've investigated to help illustrate the need for detention in some of these cases, especially the most violent. We are not talking about minor fights, user amounts of marijuana, or shoplifting. We are talking about the most heinous of crimes with real victims. Earlier this month, the mother was exiting her car holding her infant child in Northwest Omaha when she was rushed by three male juveniles who pointed a gun and her child before robbing her of her car. All three suspects were eventually arrested and released from detention within hours of the arrest, not even overnight. The victim of this carjacking feared for her life and her child's life. On June 4th, a woman was selling a car on a social media site and was lured into a house and attacked by three juveniles who attempted to steal her car. The woman fought back and refused to give up her car. At the scene was an ankle monitor that belonged to a suspect that was on juvenile probation. The suspects were quick, quickly captured and booked at the youth center. Two of these suspects were already on juvenile probation. As of today, only one remains detained at the youth center. In mid-May, a woman was exiting her car in a quiet residential neighborhood in broad daylight and was violently attacked by a group of juveniles who choked her while she screamed in fear and they took her purse and her car. The juveniles arrived in another car that they carjacked from someone else. The victim's car was spotted and led police on a dangerous pursuit before crashing into a neighborhood full of kids. Two of the suspects were already on juvenile court supervision and one had an ankle monitor that had been dead for several days. Only two of the five suspects remained detained at the youth center. A final example is a male juvenile that we arrested a couple of days ago for being in possession of a defaced illegal firearm. Gang unit officers were patrolling a neighborhood for violence um, that was known for violence such as shots fired, felony assault investigations, and they observed a male in possession of a handgun. After a foot chase, the male was apprehended and the weapon found on his person. This same juvenile had been arrested three times in one week inside of a stolen car just prior to this arrest for the stolen gun or with a defaced firearm. Members of the city council, I urge and plead with you not to support a program that drastically reduces the number of beds and space of the juvenile detention center. My fear is that the juvenile detention center will have no choice but to release these violent offenders simply because they do not have the brick and mortar to house them. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next up is Kelsey Johnson. Kelsey, are you still here? Yeah. There you are. Uh, then followed by Chris Chapelier, and final opponent is Paul Bellinger. Kelsey Johnson, 69. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Go ahead. Kelsey Johnson, 6910 Pacific Street. I'm the vice president of Local 251. So today I stand before you and ask you to vote no. Local 251 is the representative of the employees at the Douglas County Youth Center. These are the men and the women that spend time and work with the kids every single day. While we are not opposed to the relocation of the juvenile detention center, we do stand in opposition of the number of beds. As of 10 a.m. this morning, the population count of detainees is 78. In order to have a facility that houses the maximum of 64, the Juvenile Youth Center would have to have a daily average around 40 to 50. At this point, we have heard all about how the new facility will implement new programs to reduce the numbers of juvenile offenders. Why aren't these programs being implemented now and tested at the current facility in order to see if the programs work as they are truly intended? There are programs currently at there are programs at the current facility, and the, these programs have not helped to reduce the numbers. The population count has gone down because of laws, not programming. Pilot programs should have already been implemented and tested and see if they truly work and that they are a benefit to the kids. A new building is not going to change the lives of these kids. Having probation officers and lawyers next door 
to the facility are not going to change the lives of these kids. What will change the lives of these kids is getting mental health services they need. Not just spending two days at a mental health facility and getting shipped back, but actual long-term help. Currently, there are not enough, there are not adequate places for these kids to go. Girls and kids who are charged with sexual offenses have very limited options on where to be placed. Until we address the core issues, we will not see a reduction in the population at the juvenile facility. The point I'm making is that until we see these programs actually work and will reduce the numbers of ju juveniles housed in the detention center, we need to have a facility that holds the current population. We need to be sure that these kids are receiving the help that they need with programs that work and there are proper alternative placements available. We can't put workers, the community, and most importantly, juveniles at risk for programs that have yet to be created. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Chapelier, followed by Paul Bellinger, and then the proponents will have three minutes of rebuttal per the rules. And you can do that as a commissioner or Mr. Lemke or decide for yourselves who's going to do it. I don't see your other guy. Yeah, I don't either. So welcome, Mr. Bellinger. Hey, you know, the, the one thing that I wish would happen. The rules, sir, are to address us, not the audience. Well, the, the other people, the other commissioners here, I hope, do the same thing that Name everybody. We, I know you signed in, but. Paul we'll Bellinger, 10215 West Center okay. Road. It's, would you start his time all over? So. That's okay. Hey, the only thing really I think everybody in this room really wants to have applied is the golden rule, the one that we learned in first grade, the one that all the commissioners back here, I hope after this is all done, all come together and support each other just like you guys do here the golden rule is what we should apply to everybody i don't have the money to pay for somebody else's kid to to be in a in a program i don't have that money i'm sure there are thousands of other people that are shackled when you unshackle the kids that are in this program <coughs> programs cost money when you go through the $121 million and you don't have money for the program, you got an empty building that our judge says does nothing to help the people that need the help, that just need the golden rule applied. That's all. Do unto others as you wish. Them to have done unto you. That's all. Pretty basic rule. I don't have money to send somebody else's kids to a detention facility. I don't have money. I don't need more money coming out of my wallet to support somebody else's kid to go through a detention program. I went through a lot of programs when I was a kid. My, my parents employed so many programs on me, they named programs after me, okay? <laughs> Some of them could have been birth control programs, but let me tell you this much. I came out on the better end of that. I had some great parents. I had some amazing parents, but they always first came with the golden rule first, and then they beat me, okay? Just try to apply that today that nobody here has money to put kids into a program. Thank you, Commissioner. We pray for you. Hey, hey, we pray for all our, our commissioners, and we, we pray for you, too, to make the right decision, the one that follows the golden rule. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ballinger. And now we have the proponents, if you wish, three minutes rebuttal. Commissioner Rogers, you'll do the rebuttal. Good afternoon. Name and address. City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I hope to come back next week and be able to ask some specific questions, but I want to pick a couple of things and point these things out. Name and um, address. So our Chris Rogers, 1819 Farnham, Chair of the Douglas County Board. Ten years ago, um, we had an issue at the Douglas County Juvenile 
detention center where our average was somewhere around 220 kids a day. Since then, um, we put in programs and made efforts available to try to go at addressing. Hey, he's out of order. Would you take him out, please? And to try to go at addressing juvenile justice reform. At the time, we were able to do that with the combination of efforts from the state senators. And yes, there were laws implemented, but there were also programming that happened at the same time. Um, on that trek, we were going to build a facility at 42nd Street. At one time, we were going to try to build a facility in the old Federal Reserve Building. But this opportunity came, it was ideal, and we're here now. Um, our main point is to try to have the system reform and to be able to give a better opportunity to the children and the families. The one thing that was said here that juvenile is rehabilitated, there's a distinct difference between juvenile and adult. Okay, so one point I want to dispute is that, you know, Mr. Connor made a point of saying that, you know, the police are the experts. In all due respect to the police, their job, the hardness of it, they are not experts in juvenile justice. They are not. The, um, one of the members read a statement, and they're conflating and putting a fear factor in in regards to this issue that happened with the carjackings. This is official information that was given to me from the Office of Administration and Probation. Sixteen total youth were presented to juvenile intake for carjackings in the past few months. All youth went through full intake process of interviews and risk screening instruments to determine risk to the community upon release. Thirteen of those youth were detained at the time of offense and four intake procedures by juvenile intake. Three of those youth were, were released on um, full intake procedure, and they were on the home program and monitoring through DCYC. And since then, one of those three youth have been detained in county court. So this thing is being deflated as if we're putting people at risk. At no time is this about the 15 to 20 percent of the kids that are at risk that are a serious issue it's about the other 50 that aren't supposed to be in there and at the bottom line of it this is what this project is about i look forward to trying to answer more of your questions uh next week and look forward and hope and ask you to vote in support of this project thank you the public hearing is closed Non-action items, items 47 through 69, do not require public hearing or city council consideration at this meeting, but will be placed on a future agenda for public hearing and or vote. The reason for non-action is noted after the item on the agenda, as well as the date the item is expected to appear on the agenda for consideration. To adjourn. Move to adjourn. adjourn. Second. Roll call. Festerson. Yes. Gray. Yes. Harding. Yes. Melton. Pauls. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Meeting is adjourned at 4.55.